Hello, dear viewers. This is me coming to you in person to let you know about a few things about today's video. First and foremost, if you have not watched up to the Apocalypse Saga of the Utena series itself, please do so before you watch this video, otherwise there will be a lot of information that will seem very lost to you, and it's gonna get very spoilery from here on out, so it's best that you get yourself as up-to-date as possible. I also have a duty of care to let you all know that today's episode on the Uprishina Retrospective will be covering some very sensitive topics and content warnings will be given as a result of that. There will be given timestamps in the videos for said content warnings as well in case any of the mentioned parts of it are ones that may trigger today's audience, and a brief little summary at the end of each section will be done. However, if you do not wish to indulge in that, I completely understand. With that being said, however, I hope you do enjoy today's video and the finale of the retrospective of Utena. So, we've talked about Utena's beginnings and the process behind how it was created, and we've also talked about how much Utena's accolades and how it managed to impact the general anime industry of its time to now, and how its impact has managed to spread its tendrils out to the West with how much its impact can be felt in modern media outside of Japan. So what is there left to really talk about, you may be asking yourselves, apart from the rest of the series itself? Well, we haven't really discussed the big thing that Utena was known for aside from its importance and its accolades, have we? We haven't yet talked about what it's done for queer culture. I've mentioned it a lot in passing throughout this retrospective by now, but it bears spelling it out as we ready ourselves for the final 15 episode run. Utena, in a very general sense, is gay as fuck. And it's probably the reason why we have so much queerness in media today. The representation of queer characters across the board is something of which had never really been seen in a major way until Utena's airing in 1997. As well, the landscape of media's usage of queer people was something of which was limited, and even when it was given a spotlight, it was often lip service at best, and comedic value at its worst. Hence, when you look at how much positive representation it gives for bisexual and lesbian sexualities throughout the series' run, you can imagine how good it meant to the industries as a whole as falling on from Utena, there was a massive jump in representation of the sexuality spectrum like no other. I mean, the clearest example I can give is showing you the size difference of animated series with LGBT characters in it pre-Utena and post-Utena, without showing you every single one for you to get the picture. But even then, one could argue that the visibility for trans people and gender non-conforming characters went up by a lot as well, as some make a point of stating that Utena's desire to become a prince could potentially, as the post utena world of media allowed for Kido's journey to have a trans mask at its lead. Not only that, but the actual visible actions of said queer people ended up becoming more prominent in the post utena landscape than it did pre utena as, shock of all shocks, when you show queer people being happy in media that you present them in and being loving towards one another, it leads to that being more prominent. Hell, you want to know what one of my favorite examples of queer representation in the immediate post utena world is? Tsukasa and Subaru from Dot Hack Sign. It may be a bit of a curveball, but their relationship has all the hallmarks of what queer representation in media had in the wake of Utena's leave, come the new millennium that followed on from it. I'll more than likely talk about their relationship more in detail when I eventually talk about Dot Hack as a franchise, but to summarize what I mean real quick surrounding Tsukasa and Subaru, their relationship dynamic is akin to that of Utena and Anfi with Tsukasa being the gender non-conforming girl playing a male character due to various traumas, and Subaru being the woman they seemingly fall in ever more in love with despite the hardships they mutually go through throughout the series, even end up with the two sharing the protector and protectee status throughout the series' run as their relationship grows, ending with them becoming a couple outside of the game the series takes place in, and becoming the first canon lesbian couple in anime for the 2000s, a trend of which would not be stopped in the years to come as more queer relationships and representation came out of the woodwork as the years rolled on. 
And this wasn't just in anime and manga either, as the West would slowly but surely go from poking fun at queer people throughout the 90s and 2000s, and, and eventually, you have re the representation that we have today in shows like Steven Universe, Owl House, OKKO, She-Ra, Amphibia, Legend of Korra, look, I've mentioned a lot of these before, and it gets older and older every time I do it, but the point remains. Queer representation has gotten better and better post Uta's airing, and there's a strong argument to be made that for every series that takes inspiration or references Uta in one way or another, that there's a bigger chance it has a level of queerness within it. And it stands to reason that, without Utena, there arguably wouldn't be as much of a queer media as we all know and love today because of it breaking the boundaries of what could be acceptable by the standards of modern media and changing the game forever for us queer folk to be seen. So it only stands to reason that Utena isn't for the cishets, Utena is most certainly for the queers. Welcome back, dear viewers. Hope the road to getting here wasn't too long to travel through, because today we finally reach our final destination on this eternal path through the Ushina Mythos. And while we still may have a bit left to go through with this journey, the beginning of the end starts with us discussing the Ushina finale's final arc, and while some tend to split this up into two separate arcs, we'll be discussing it as it's been commonly referred to for the last 26 years as its combined title of the Apocalypse Saga. Comprising of the final 15 episodes of Revolutionary Girl Utena, compared to the 24 before it, it's seen as some of the densest parts of the Utena series as a whole. And, as you're about to see, even without having battles present in each episode of it, it still manages to keep the viewers interested in and glued to their seats at every turn. But given we have this many episodes to go through alongside a lot more to discuss during and after the fact, we should make a start back down the road, shouldn't we? However, before we get started, I feel it best to catch you all up on some bits I glossed over slightly in the Black Rose Saga, which seems to be a bit more appropriate to bring to your attention now. Okay, so slight backstory time just to get ourselves up to speed on what has been happening with the Student Council given they weren't a major focus in the Black Rose Saga compared to the first saga. And honestly, for the most part anyway, Toga more or less spent the entirety of the last saga mentally checked out following his defeat at the hands of Utena. Falling into such a pit of depression, Nanami had to basically plead for him to eat something before she left for the day. He did get better over time as we saw in his interactions with Keiko, but to be blunt here, it's hard to tell if he was of sound mind during that whole affair. Speaking of Nanami, however, she actually takes over as the head of the student council in Toga's stead. While her results aren't much to be desired, given it how much of an influence they have over the plot of the last saga, it does leave a lot for Nanami's character to grow outside of her focused episodes. Not only that, but it's made clear during all of this that End of the World has all but deserted them during this time that the Black Rose duelists were running rampant throughout the school, leading them to believe they were no longer serving a purpose underneath Nanami's rule. That being said, however, it's not as though they were completely ignorant on the situation surrounding the Black Rose duelists, as Mickey and Drew's encounters were both acknowledged and discussed in the subsequent episodes of their group ups, stating them as a threat to not just the Rose Bride, but as a threat to them as well during this time. Hell, during the last episodes of the main portion of the Black Rose saga, they're seen as part of the team investigating the phenomena surrounding the Black Rose duelists after all of them became victims of the duelists, getting them in one way or another. So with that out of the way, let's get to the beginning of the Apocalypse Saga with episode 25, Their Eternal Apocalypse. This episode starts us off with two big things that change the dynamic of the series moving forward on both sides for Utena and Amphi as well as the student council with End of the World. The first one being that we now see a no longer comatose Toga with Akio Otori, who if you recall from last time has been hinted at to be the mastermind known as End of the World through several bits of storytelling, driving along a seemingly endless highway in what will be a very stunning, yet very familiar looking car moving forward. The two talk very casually as well as very less than subtly being sexually charged between the two of them as Akio drives off with Toga being encouraged to take the wheel. God damn it, Akio, why do you constantly have to have sexual shit going on? The second is a bit more of a sudden slam right to the face, as it's revealed that, without warning, Uta and Amphi are now staying at Akio's house now instead of their dorm rooms, a major change that will have ramifications for the remainder of the series' run. 
While the explanation of this sudden change is that Akio doesn't have any other family members to be around him and thus was to keep Amphi nearby as much as possible, it's clear in how this is presented that Utena currently is being treated as a tag-along, at least for the moment. Something to come back to. Alongside Toga's resurgence in the beginning, he assumes control as the student council president once more from Nanami, alongside bringing back in a returning Sayonji from his exile thanks to the deal he made with Makage back in the Black Rose Saga, with him flippantly dismissing his absence in such a way that it makes his behavior in said saga more callous than ever before. However, in a move that shocks everyone, Sairoji makes it clear he isn't going to be part of the Rose Bride duels any longer, citing his betrayal by Toga in the Student Council Saga which led to his exile to begin with as the reasoning why, even stating that he refuses to be end of the world's lackey anymore and won't duel because he's ordered to in the letters. This action, albeit stated in a, de in a defiant manner of which we have come to expect by Sergi at this point, is one of which will not only have some lasting consequences at the student council moving forward, but will be the first hints of one of the bigger moves as it comes to the Bro Rosebride duels, and one duelist in particular. But that's for later. Another thing to pay attention to is Mickey's talk of there being a potential new stage in the duels to ascend to, as talks of a gondola have appeared in the arena to take them to such a new stage. Whether this is a metaphorical one or otherwise remains to be seen, but it's clear we're beginning to enter the final stage of the story, and even the characters are aware of it as they begin to question who really is End of the World. And the person who we know as End of the World by now is already adjusting to a life with Uta and Evie close by. However, there appears to be a darker hint as to what may be his big gambit approaching as he tries to get closer to Utena, as well as smirking as she walks away from it. It's also when we are shown an intimate scene between Uta and Amphi, as Utena reaffirms herself as Amphi's protector as the one who wields the Rose Bride, but doubling as her wanting to affirm that beyond such needs it's her stating to Amphi she wishes to be her friend. Something of which hasn't been affirmed as much from Uta until now, showing a distinct change from her initial refusal to even fool with the idea of being the person who wielded such power in the beginning. It's then smash cut to the Kendo Room as we see the first encounter between Sayoji and Togas as the student council saga, and between Togas' continued smug attitude returning from his Kurato state, as well as Sayoji's bitter anger towards him for betraying him in such a way. You can tell that this is a meeting that, in any other circumstance, would end with violence. This is Utena, though, and nothing is just as it seems in the world of Atori, as Toga leads Sayoji to listen in to the sound that races to the end of the world, and, as if on cue, Akio and his sports car appear to take Sayoji and us on a ride. I wanna take you for a ride! No, 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 let's be serious here. The ride of which they go on is one of which manages to try and convince Sirenji to try and face off with the Rose Bride once more. However adamant he seems to be about it throughout this process may betray his intents. This also paints a very specific picture about the nature of Sirenji and Toga's relationship that was only really hinted at in the Black Rose Saga. One of which paints their friendships not ex as explicitly mutual, and one of always being a rivalry at best and a one-sided situation of benefit at its worst. However, with the bombshell drop that the prince who had convinced Utena to remain noble and pure of heart wasn't Toga, but rather it was Akio Atori himself, a drop done so casually you would have to pause for a good moment to process it on the first viewing of this show, as well as confirming to the viewers that Ed Sayoji that he is in fact end of the world, does, con does the convincing of Sayoji become complete, and he manages to find himself back in the grass with the Rose Bride duels once more. The next day, we see Sayonji appear alongside the sports car from Akio, preparing for his third duel against Utena for Amphi, beginning the rematches with the student council which will be spread throughout this part of the saga, as he arguably has reverted back to his more harsh persona scene in the first two episodes in order to duel for her once more. And much like it was hinted at beforehand, there is in fact major changes to the dueling arena once more to symbolize its attention to the next stage of the duels, as not only is there a gondola as an elevator to replace the ascent of the dueling arena via staircase, not only has there been a new version of Zetai Unmei Mokushioku being used as the prelude music for this saga, but Usa and Evi now have a shared transformation sequence to symbolize the change of their bond from this part of the saga onwards. The arena itself, however, hasn't really changed on first glance, until the bells ring and suddenly copies of Akira's car suddenly come out from the ground itself. Not as striking or unique as the tables, but hey, cars do make for interesting pieces to maneuver around, I suppose. 
Sayonji is back to using his standard sword against Utena a la their second duel, but he's arguably a lot more bitter and enlightened, having seen the end of the world by Akio and Toga. That he ends up being able to get a few good strikes onto Utena through the beginning, up until the Sword of Dios we've known up until now vanishes from Utena's grasp. This kicks in the dual theme for Sayonji's third duel, Virtual Star Embryology, which also soundtracks the second ending for Utena from this episode onwards. While very vague in its overall meaning, it does give birth to the phrase empty movement. Aside from that, however, much like the first dual themes before it, its meaning isn't as crucial to the narrative at large. What is crucial to the narrative at large is the way the Sword of Dios returns through Uta and Amphi's ever-deepening bond, as Amphi not only protects Uta from being struck by Sayonji to end the duel, but also summons a new sword not from herself, but from Utena instead. A massive showing about how much their bond has grown as the dynamic in its summoning has now been reversed, as they are now both granted the power of revolution. And as Dios Ex Machina comes into play shortly after, Kara crashes with Sionji's rose petals and the, and the duel comes to a sudden end with Sionji losing once more to the combined strength of the ones that will revolutionize the world together, as Akio and Toga look on throughout. Speaking of the both of them, however, it does seem as though there is more going on with them than we know, as they speak casually once more over Sionji's fate, Akio even calling Toga a wicked man for doing such a thing to his friend. However, as the episode ends, we are greeted with Akio's more frustrated side and annoying the Sword of Tears to not appear, as Amphi looks a bit more... in fear, as she stays by her brother's side this time than what we saw in the Black Rose Saga. Utena laying by her low sim in their room, as the episode comes to an end, and the long road begins for the viewers. The following episode, Mickey's Nest Box, The Sunlit Garden Arranged, is obviously a Mickey episode. I feel like trying to deny it at this point is a bit passé, but it starts us off once again with Akio and Toga plotting in Akio's car, stating how they need to defeat Utena and take Amphi away from her as quickly as possible. So of course, having had Sionji fail, they obviously go in order once again of who worked in the past and bring Mickey into the fold as the next opponent of choice for Utena. Which does make sense as well, Mickey has gotten a lot better with his personal feelings of wanting Amphi over time since their last duel. He did say he would duel for her again eventually. The plot however kicks off with Kozue trying to save a bird's nest, almost falling to her death with Mickey and Utena saving her all because a tree was getting cut down. The relationship between the two of them is still seeming a bit tense following on from the events in the Black Rose Saga, but seemingly on better terms as their initial encounters in the Student Council Saga. Meanwhile, another letter from End of the World makes the intentions of the Student Council clear. Defeat Utena Tenjo for the sake of the duelists, effectively saying that they are no longer dueling at Utena for the Rose Bride, but for the goal of taking out Utena. This, of course, upsets Mickey, who begins questioning the entire premise of End of the World using the Student Council, proclaiming End of the World to be a selfish adult and refusing to take part in the duels akin to Sionji last episode. However, much like Sionji last episode, it's clear as day what's about to happen with Mickey's denial of being a part of the duels, and it's kicked into gear when Amphi is being used behind the scenes to push Mickey's mental state into dis disarray by posing as his father's new wife. At least that's what we can only assume with what happens in the following scene. Trying to keep up with things from here on out is going to be hard, FYI. This, alongside someone who appears to be Akio taking Kozoi by the arm, referring to her as her daddy long legs, and Toga attempting to coerce him once more at the same kind of feelings that he had previously, with Mickey making clear the indication that he's been made aware of Toga's strange actions, does Akio begin to appear with his car. And the next thing you know, all four of them are in the car together, Kozoi saying that she's on a date with Akio, doubles down on the trying to convince Mickey to try and be a part of the duels once again, and, despite his best intents, he's convinced that in order to get what he desires the most, he must be seduced into being impure like those around him, and challenges Uta to Tenjo to their second duel. When they enter, it's a striking choice that Kozoi is the Rose Bride for Mickey in this scenario, especially given that in this one instance she was responsible for leading him down this path to face Utena for Anthe again. Don't think this will be the last time we see this happen as well either, it's going to be something we come back to in this arc. 
The song that plays during this battle, an immortal emperor in a mundane universe, has lyrics mentioned about how, despite the world changing, the person singing it does not change, could be an implication of something of the kind of mindset someone like Mickey has, believing that while he remains pure, it's, up, it's to his own detriment that he remains this way, potentially being a reason for his continued actions in this arc for dueling. This duel, however, has Mickey showcase the most aggressive fighting style he's ever done so in this one. Being the first to go and attempt the first strikes to Utena as opposed to his more defensive strategy in their initial duel some 23 episodes prior to this. While this is happening, however, Kozue attempts to try and distract Amphi and get under his skin by trying to gain power for herself. Despite causing a distraction to Mickey in the process, leaving him open for a typical Deus Ex Machina and the ending of the duel in a swift fashion. The relationship between the two siblings returns to a more harsh one by the end of it, and the episode just suddenly ends with that. Yeah, I got nothing. That finale came by way too quickly for my taste. It feels like there should have been a lot more going on here with Kozaway and Mickey, especially with how the two have more or less been on better ground, and are now, once again, are at an emotional wall. I don't know if this was intentional for them, but it leaves a slight sour taste in my mouth for this part of the saga, which once again leads us to an interesting way to follow up this episode with... Nanami's Egg. Contrary to my thoughts on the last saga's Nanami-centered episodes, I don't think all of them are trash and should be skipped. While some of them are pretty goddamn inane and poorly placed for the most part, I need to reiterate that what I mentioned in the Student Council saga that some of the Nanami episodes do still have merit behind them. It just so happens that one's last saga didn't exactly have a lot of merit to hold with them, and were pretty poorly placed in the grand scheme of things. And so, comes Nanami's egg which focuses on Nanami taking care of an egg which suddenly appears in her bed one day as she wakes up, having dreamt of finding a similar situation occurring when she found an egg as a child. The pr that premise alone may make you think I'm about to rip this episode to shreds, but honestly I don't mind this episode as much as the last three that Yamaguchi had done to be focused on Nanami, as she spends the majority of the episode believing someone had placed it there in order to make her seem weird. Given that she has attempted to do the same thing to Anfi in the past, it could... I considered this a bit of karmic retribution, but that's another talking point to get to eventually. But she does end up spending the majority of the episode trying to protect the egg that had popped up at the beginning, even having Mickey examine it to be sure, but not mentioning the truth of the egg to anyone with the fear of people believing that she's a space alien. My personal highlight of these is her crashing into jury and mistaking her bowling ball for an egg like hers. The entire exchange is hilarious in my personal opinion, and the punchline of it happening is one of the best out of any of Yamaguchi's writing, to be honest. That being said though, the fact there's a revelation in this episode that, that Anvi has several animals named after Nanami is a bit interesting, but it does have a point when you get near the end and, unlike Cowbell of Happiness, comes across a bit more of a sidebar more than anything else. However, Nanami being convinced to abandon the egg after Toga makes a comment of her being a girl who doesn't lay eggs is a bit disheartening, only for her to come back and find the egg is gone, Sionji cooking up something, and I think we can all make the assumption as to what it is, and that is until Sionji shows the egg Nanami had being in safe condition, and Nanami taking it away. Not before Sionji burns his own egg, by the way. Now it's ruined! The ending of the episode, however, is definitely what we've come to expect, as Nanami's egg ends up growing in size, zapping a laser at her, and then breaking open, and then Nanami awakes from a dream to find a broken egg in her bed. Is it dumb for a climax? Is it really just kind of stupid in general? Maybe, yes. But the premise in general is fine as a nice little breather in this period of the show, especially what we have to come. And honestly, I can't really fault it for that, especially when compared to what we went through last saga. It's probably not even that bad as the last three Nanami episodes, to be honest. And it also, arguably, makes for a nice little break before we step into the latter part of this arc, as the next two episodes are kind of a mini-arc, as one would put it, as we not only return to the dynamic between Juri and Shiori's strained mutual yearning for each other, while also introducing one final duelist into the fray. And it only makes sense that after we've had the reveal of who she was in the Black Rose Saga, that we have the final piece of the puzzle in him in this saga. 
Episode 28, Whispers in the Dark, is the start of this two-parter in question, as we see Drury once again pining for feelings that she is unable to express properly, obviously referring to her previous feelings for Shiori, all the while going through person after person in the fencing club, all until a mysterious dark blue-haired man steps up to face off against her, one of whom Drury appears to recognize almost instantly as soon as they square off against each other, Drury being described as slower than this person, who she refers to as Captain. This new character, Ruka Suchia, was the original captain of the Fencing Club before Drury took over in his stead. With his ease of access to the student council room indicated that he may as well have been a member of the council previously, or alternatively been brought in by Akio as a duelist to vie for Anfi for Ushida following on from Sayoji and Miki's failure to do so. However, he initially doesn't make it clear if initially if he will end up dueling Ushida, as he ends up taking over from Juri as the captain of the fencing club, with him being a playboy for all the girls to fought over, even getting a bit handsy with some of the members of the fencing club. But with Shiori's appearance, we know for a fact that nothing good can come of this. See, Shiori still pies for Ruka in the same way that Juri pies for Shiori, being the person she fell in love with to try and hurt Juri in the, be in the end, and their history being one that ends up with both of them seemingly hooking up in public together, scorning Juri to the point of going directly for Ruka. It's then that we are revealed to the history between Juri and Ruka, with him having trained Juri for the first when she first came to Tori and joined the fencing club. With Ruka praising Juri as a duelist while Juri can only demand he stays away from Shiori, with Ruka pressing the issue and Juri still being unable to convey her own feelings about her to him, with Ruka only responding that he has a right to pursue Shiori if, he, if he's living what one would call a normal school life. But as if knowing the truth about why she said it, he continues to go after Shiori, and even kisses her in front of Juri as she looks on. Juri, in this moment, realizing that her secret is known by the both of them. Juri, however, tries to warn Shiori of Ruka's behavior, only for it to fall on deaf ears. And the next thing we know, we see Toga meeting Shiori instead of Ruka. And we immediately realize that Juri was more than correct in her warning than first fought, as Shiori is quickly whisked away onto the road, riding in the back seat alongside Ruka. However, Shiori is more than welcoming of this that we, the audience would have believed, making her the perfect partner for Ruka to prepare to duel Utena within many, many ways. God, this sexual tension in this arc is fucking weird! And of course, next week we know, Ruka and Shiori are at the Rose Garden challenging Utena to duel for Anfi, and the first duel for reaching Ruka has now been set in motion. Similar to the way that Kozue was Mickey's bride in the previous duel episode, Shiori is Ruka's bride in, in this episode, signifying the more submissive nature to Ruka to spite Juri, and even to an extent Utena, with, with Ruka even stating that he may not be able to beat her despite stating his ability is greater than that of Juri's. The song backdropping this duel, The Angel Androgynous, the lyrics potentially being sung from the perspective of Jury with its talk about making the world a place for the two of us only, and with Shiori's obsessiveness over Ruka being apparent during this part of the saga, makes it clear that this definitely seems like Shiori's PRV. Going into the duel itself, however, it does show how much more of an experienced and faster fighter that Ruka is in comparison to Jury. Even trying similar mind games that Toga had used in the past during the duels in question with his comparisons to Toga and Sionji, and even using his illness to get under the skin being clear indicators that Ruka knows what he's doing, and he's done it very well in the past. However, despite his mind games and experience, Ruka is unable to match the power of Dio Sex Machina, and ends up faltering at the hands of Utada with a disappointed look on his face as he just stands in front of a crash Shiori in the dueling arena, seemingly annoyed that his plan not working out as he intended to. Almost as if on cue, he instantly casts aside Shiori as she begs for him to duel with her again for Anfi, plainly saying that the sword that she polished out of dedication to him wasn't even his to begin with, and that he never cared for her as much as she did for him. Jury feeling emboldened by what happened to figure out what Ruka's true intentions are for returning. Leading us into the following episode of this mini-arc in episode 29, Azure Paler Than The Sky, which follows on immediately from the climax of last episode, with Shiori stating the same phrase that was said to Jury about miracles and their feelings. Except no miracle comes for Shiori. She was merely a pod used by Ruka for something much more harmful. 
when she makes clear by coldly dumping her in front of the whole school to start this episode off. Jury making it clear that she doesn't care much for the situation involving Shiori, trying to keep her distance on the matter to spare her feelings in regards to Shiori, having been burnt one too many times thanks to the situation involving Ruka when Uta attempts to get her involved on the matter. She doesn't last long on this front, however, she does end up going to see Shiori in order to try and make amends. However, Shiori is still very much scorned over the whole affair and ends up simply telling her off, still very much not over Ruka. Ruka, however, proves that he's fully in league with Akio as he discusses his next plans to duel Utena, planning to instead use Juri as his next pawn in his schemes as it were, making it clear by staring her down in the fencing club. But Juri has other ideas as she essentially begs Ruka to take Shiori back if it will make her happy, citing her happiness over her own being a fit. Ruka, however, ends up declining it and insults Shiori right in front of Juri. Almost as if knowing what will happen by doing so, Juri is instantly incensed by the words and his demeanor in question. She instantly tries to punch him, only for Ruka to turn the tables on her immediately. And, uh... Let's just say as Mephis were trying to get at Jury on his for his side and not the most safe for work. But he does end up getting the leverage over Jury that he needs by stealing her locket while embraced, heartlessly attempting to step on it before Jury slaps him and clutches it. And much like what Ruka ends up saying after the fact, her face can only show the most bitter hatred for him over what he's just done not just to Shiori, but to her as well, challenging him to a duel instead. This being the first time we see a non doing arena duel take place just before they cut away, before eventually showing that Juri has been defeated. And within the next moment, Ruka calls for Akio, and the next thing we know, they are both riding in the car into the end of the world. Against her will, of course, as her demeanor doesn't change the entire time. However, it's made clear that Ruka's entire plot to make Juri his next partner to try and take down Utena, using her own need to destroy miracles against her, alongside the concept of miracles from Shiori. However, Juri also makes it clear in this bit that she doesn't necessarily care if her feelings are returned or not by Shiori, instead choosing to simply use her feelings to protect her from Ruka. But in order to do it, she needs to succumb to the whims of Ruka for one duel, and one duel only, against Utena. Utena and Juri both lamenting this fact the moment she spotted in front of her. Utena wanting it to not be so as Juri challenges her bluntly and emotionless, making it clear neither of them want to be in this predicament, but they need to for their own reasons. Juri, despite not being the rosebride garment in the same manner of Shiori or Kozue before her, is in the position of being the partner for Ruka in this duel, reluctantly telling Ruka to go through with it to make it as quick for them as possible, even their body language being more strained than any other partner before now. However, the twist is that Ruka is not the duelist in this one, as he is merely the one to summon forth Juri's sword from herself this time around. The song that plays in this duel, I Am All the Mysteries of Creation, is sung from the PRV of Juri, with the lyrics of being a shield in them indicating the similar feeling of being someone to protect those she cares about, mainly being one Shiori as we found out earlier in the ride through End of the World. The duel itself for Juri's second and final duel in the arena shows a clear difference with their first duel in the series, as their own duel mirrors the one that took place between Ruka and Juri just before this one. Juri hesitating multiple times, and much like their previous duel in episode 7, shows Juri being harsh and brutal in her strikes, but careless when it counts. This comes to the clear ending that you would expect as Deers falls from the arena, and you expect the duel to end there, but instead of it striking Juri's rose, it instead strikes Juri's locket, destroying it entirely within moments, leaving Juri distraught in the arena and, for the first and only time in the series, throws down her rose in response and gives up the duel, having lost something much more important during this. The sky darkens for the only time in the arena, Juri just standing there, silent and unmoving as she's attempted to be consoled by Ruka, but she remains silent and doesn't move during all of this, with the next scene indicating that won't be the case, as it's revealed Ruka has left again, Juri taking his place once more. As this arc ends, there's a whisper that the reason why Ruka ended up leaving again is because he actually died, his illness catching up in him is an attempt to try and free Juri from her feelings for Shiori. But as the episode ends and Shiori is seen trailing behind Juri, as they walk the grounds, it's implied that their relationship, despite all of its bumps, may be finally gained to a stage where they can truly be happy. Whether as lovers or platonically, it remains to be seen. 
And I hope you enjoyed that little bit of an arc right there, because aside from two more before the finale, that was one of the last dual-centered storylines in the entire series. Sure, like I said, we still have two more before the finale comes around to look forward to, but just let me put this in perspective. We still have 10 episodes of this series remaining to talk about, and only two or three of them contain any duels. So I really hope you all enjoy me talking about Dead's character stuff. Well, strap yourselves in, people. This is going to be a very dense haul through to the finale. And it all starts with this next stretch of episodes. <sighs> Said stretch of episodes begins with episode 30, The Barefoot Girl, which begins the next big development for the story as it focuses primarily on the continuously building relationship between Usuna and Akio, which has been in the works arguably since as early as episode 14 when they were first introduced. Fair warning on this part of the series, episodes like this are probably going to be more summarized as a lot of these talking points can be found under, we'll talk about this later, given how much we still have yet to talk about and their importance becoming more and more shown off in later episodes. But as for what this episode ends up bringing to the table, there's talk between many of the characters in the series about Usha need to be more like a girl, as if to remind her of her place in life as a woman, before being interrupted by Akio as members of the school end up trying to dress her down. This, among many previous actions such as Akio talking to her constantly throughout the Black Rose Saga for advice on many different matters that were being brought up during said saga, make it clear that Akio has suddenly been taking Usha under his wing, for quite some time. And it's becoming more and more obvious that there's something going on behind the scenes as from when they suddenly move in in episode 25 and even later in this episode when he seduces Kanai's mother and the chairman's wife, making it clear he'll use whatever methods deemed necessary to keep his plans in motion. But as we see Wakaba go on a date with Akio, do we start to see her conviction begin to waver throughout this episode? As she continues to question her devotion to her prince, as Akio continues to make move after move on trying to sway what he calls his golden goose into his arms. A move he has probably done more than once as shown in the past with manipulating and falling in love with the likes of Tokiko in the Black Rose Saga, and not only that, seemingly is using Amphius of Rosebride to try and push Ushina closer and closer to Akio. Shown as she leads her away as she sprays her ankle right to Akio's arms, and then some. This begins the arc's bigger narrative of Akio's manipulation of Usuna and slowly grooming her to be his next lover, in a sense, playing his hand cleanly with the above and it being clear by episode's end that he may have already gotten to his goal. The episode to follow this, however, her tragedy doesn't directly follow along with this realization to the audience and instead follows the realization in-universe for one character in particular as a Tori, that being one Nanami Kiryu, that her entire life and everything she knows is Unfortunately, one foul, hollow lie. Now, I know I've said a lot of negative things about Nanami-centered episodes last time, and even had a very dull opinion of them in the Student Council saga part, but would you at all be surprised that after all I had to say about those episodes, that I think these two episodes we're about to talk about aren't just some of the best episodes for Nanami as a character of focus, but might just be some of the best in the entire show, period? Not even kidding with that last part, these two, in my opinion, are the best episodes Yamaguchi ever wrote for the show, which is ironic given he saved his best for last, and he goes out on a huge note and arguably sets the stage with two big revelations that change the way you'll view parts of this series forever. And the first one is arguably the one that hits Nanami the closest and begins her spout for this back-to-back -back swan song for her, as Nanami's continued obsession with Toga and her wanting to be the only thing he ever cares about, despite his devilish playboy antics as seen in this very episode, becomes the focal point of this part of the episode, wherein she begins to meddle in the affairs of his personal life such as stealing the cell phone he uses to keep in contact with various women he's toying along with, and begins to tell him to buzz off, even mistaking Ushin of having been one of them as well and attempts to make her pay for it, only for her to falter and be saved by Akio at the last minute. This moment, while harmless at first, brings Nanami into the sights of Akio for the first time in the series, with her sights of seeing Akio and Anvi together as brother and sister in person together beginning to make her jealous of their entire dynamic, with her continued jealousy of Anvi continuing to be presented throughout this episode plot. We'll come back to this in a moment. 
However, there's one moment that spurs on Nanami into a realization of their family relationship when, he, when she comes to realize that, despite her and her parents being type B blood, Toga is type A. This alongside noticing there's no family pictures of Toga as a younger child makes Nanami and the audience by proxy realize they are not blood siblings. This sends Nanami's entire world crashing down around her, refusing to stay at the Kiryu household and sleep at other members of the student council, and even trying to stay at Ms. Mitsuru's domicile instead, eventually setting on staying at the chairman's residence alongside Usa and Anthe. Much to all of their charging. That is, until Toga attempts to mend the situation and bring her back with him to their home. Confused as to why she would sadly leave their home together when she blurts out the truth that she has discovered to him, to the shock of everyone else in the room and Toga's confirmation. What follows is a genuinely tender moment for Nanami, with her feelings being conflicted on the matter as she still considers Toga her brother, but due to the shock of the situation, is unable to return or reconcile her feelings for him as she loves him potentially more than just her brother. Thus, she stays at the chairman's residence, and in place of Amphi, sleeps in the bed with Ushina and, following along from a short conversation on the episode's affairs, attempts to find the bathroom. But what she instead finds leaves her in utter shock and awe in the observatory. What exactly is it that she saw that sends her back into the elevator in even more shock? <sighs> we'll talk about it in a moment. This then leads us into the following episode, Romance of the Dancing Girls, which directly follows up on this double whammy of Anonymy, who continuously has flashbacks to what she saw the night before as she sees the Yatori siblings the next day. This, alongside the continued shock of her blood relation to Toga, and her continued spitefulness over Anthony that has been prevalent this entire series, cascade into an anger outburst at the breakfast table. This is something I feel like I should bring up now, as it's maybe the only opportune time to do so, given the narrative theme coming into full focus with the revelations at hand, as well as Nanami's focus point. As many of you pointed out to me up until this point in the comments section of the last video and even the Student Council Saga video, the relationship between Nanami and Anfi is one that mirrors between the two, with Nanami believing that she sees herself in Anfi, especially in this arc with her jealousy towards Anfi's initial treatment by Akira before seeing what she saw, and it twisting her own perception of what she desires most. Because of this, it recontextualizes a lot of what Nanami has done leading up to this arc, with her over-reliance and need for Toga as a dependency mirroring the same kind of actions being done to Anfi, and the realization for her sends her spiraling for the remainder of this episode. But Nanami, for all of her faults throughout this series, makes a point to Uchida that she doesn't realize the truth over what's happening with the siblings as well as Atori Academy itself, with this being the first time that she's ever dealt with the darker aspects of the school, having only meddled with the duels and slighter affairs previously. Arguably, this is Nanami's finest hour she begins to realize the world she's been ignorant to this entire time with her popular mean girl way of living thanks to her association with Toga has crumbled, and the reality of how messed up Atori Academy truly is is come face to face, and trying to make Ushina see it as well is an act of defiance she may pay dearly for. However, her continued strain over her relationship with Toga continues to be present throughout this episode as well, as having been spotted meddling with another girl again, Toga spins a tale that he was forced to treat her like a real little sister, saying that he could never truly love someone as plain and boring like Nanami, spurning her on even further when she was revealed the woman he's meddling with is Keiko. However, Keiko doesn't remember what happened back in the Black Rose Saga, and, and probably gets a patented Nanami slap to the face for all her troubles, and much to her shock, her pleas to Toga does nothing but embolden Keiko to bring him away from her, with Nanami making it clear as day that she's just like everyone else, her connection to Toga being completely shattered. And this makes her the perfect target for one end of the world to come and take her for a ride to at last confront her feelings, stating that Toga is waiting for her but he isn't the one waiting for her at the residence. Her realization of End of the World being Akio Tori isn't one of shock, but one of disgust to realize that the one who's pulled the strings behind the scene was in reality the same person who had brought her into his own home, with Toga being his usual self regarding it. But for this one instance, Toga finally relents on Nanami's supposed desires, with her having conflicting emotions once again over what she saw in the previous episode, making her recoil in disgust, making them both question what is it she truly wants of Toga. 
We've said confrontation being the very thing that makes her return to Atori, regains her troop off screen by beating the shit out of them, it seems, and gives Amphi one last slap on the series for good measure, bringing her back to her original persona again to challenge Utena for Amphi, while using Choo Choo as a hostage for good measure. Nanami enters, alongside Turgus, into the dueling arena, stating that she wants to surpass everything by beating Utena. Believing it will allow her to surpass Utena, Toga, and everyone else around her. Her need for superiority rearing its ugly head once more. This duel's theme, the Natural Compatriot's Palace Perspective Book, fits in with the earlier comments made by Akio as End of the World, with him mentioning about how Nanami's perspective of what she had seen previously is just one perspective of the world, and how that perspective can be so easily self-interested, with the song continuing to reflect Nanami's potential perspective of the world at large around her. Compared to the first duel in the Student Council Saga some 22 episodes ago, Nanami's fight with the way more conviction and strength than she had previously, with her landing some significant strikes on Ushina prior to the expected result of Dio Sex Machina coming in to strike Nanami's rose down and end the duel. I will say, she did last more than a minute this time, so good job, Nanami! The duel, however, has a mental back and forth between Utena and Nanami that I feel pushes it leagues above that previous duel for being like a full, complete, full circle moment for Nanami as a character. Much like this entire arc is for her in a way, as they mentally battle each other as physically battle over the supposed need for Nanami to be what she once was to Toga, with Utena bitterly asking by the end if it was worth it, only to be met by Nanami questioning her very meaning if not being Toga's sister, considering herself no better or worse off than anyone else at Otori Academy now. But the truth of the matter being revealed after the fact that the two are in fact related by blood, just not with the Kiryu family, having both been adopted by them when they were younger, hence explaining the furnace. This reveal, however, is unclear if it will ever reach Nanami, as aside from a few bits near the end of the series where she does make an appearance, her appearances like Wakaba become much more sparse throughout the remainder of the series, and we don't see much of her story get told after this. So her fate in regards to this part of it is unsure by the end of things. And yet, it's not the worst thing to happen in this part of the saga, as we reach episode 33, The Prince Who Runs Through the Night. Believe it or not, in terms of general episode content, there's really not a lot to talk about here, as it's basically for the majority of an eclipse show, with the fraying device being Utena and Akio in a hotel room, having a shared a day together at a theme park. This episode proceeds to flashback between their moments together in the hotel as they finish up for the day, alongside Akio riding through in his convertible as he answers his question on a radio talk show, with them trying to figure out what is the meaning of eternal and miracles and so forth, with it all being tied together with moments from the previous episodes up until now and being their duel meetings. During the two moments, it also proceeds to flashback to previous duels in this saga as mentioned before, very much akin to that of tracing a path from the end of the Student Council saga. But unlike that of tracing a path, this episode doesn't necessarily bridge the gap between one arc to another, but it still holds a significant moment at the end of it. As, at the end of the episode, having spent the entire evening winding down, we see what appears to be Ursula trying to sleep, being interrupted by someone off-screen as she pensively looks over, and the next thing we see is... A POV shot of Utena, her hair messed up on the bed, and from the looks of things is naked, muttering to herself about her sandwiches for tomorrow, Anfi, and all in a matter that makes it seem not very great to say the least. <sighs> Alright, kind of unavoidable by this point. Let's talk about this then. Content warnings about for this whole bit, by the way. For those of you who are probably nervous by this point, I've skipped over a few aspects from episodes 31 and 32 that are key to what Nanami endured prior to this episode's events. It wasn't for trying to misguide those who are unaware of this, mind you, it was so that I could condense my thoughts on what we're about to talk about into one particular section. See, you know how I mentioned back in the Black Rose Saga about how there's a certain section that doesn't get any better on repeat viewings? Well, in the climax of episode 31, the site of which Nanami stumbled upon that I had mentioned in passing we'd talk about in a minute is what has been happening in between those bits between Amphi and Akio, and the truth of the relationship between the two 
is that Akio Atori has been sexually assaulting his own sister on a consistent basis for a very long time, and Nanami is the first of the group to realize the shock of the matter. This reveal, however, was foreshadowed in episode 25, as Akio forcibly pushes Amphi onto the couch, and an image of her being overtaken by a silhouette of the planetarium surrounding her in a position akin to sexual assault was the first indication to the viewers as to the reality of the relationship between Akio and Anthe. This later follows on into episode 32, where, where Nanami cannot stop thinking about it, and has her own conflicting feelings come about in regards to her own feelings with Toga, as main mentioned previously. But therein lies the more harsher aspect that Nanami now knows the truth of the relationship dynamic between the person that Uchida cares about the most and the person her brother works for as well as take care of as his sister. However, this isn't the only aspect that is shocking as it's also revealed in the same episode that Kanaya has seemingly fallen into a catatonic state, with it being unclear as to what is going on to make her this way. But one thing is for certain... It involves Akio and Anfi. And then comes what has basically happened throughout this entire episode. See, the little moments interspersed between Utsuna and Akio being together? We've seen this entire episode through the point of view of Akio Atori. While in of itself is an interesting storytelling device, this effectively means that we are seeing all of the events to come from the person who has already done unspeakable acts to his own sister. And throughout this entire episode, there's a bit of tension in the moments between Utsuna and Akio. I don't think I've mentioned it previously, but Ushna only stretches like this if she's when she's anxious, and she doesn't make eye contact with Akio the entire episode, even as we see that Akio has taken Ushna to bed with him. And for those who are attentive enough to notice, she's wearing a gown and have mentioned having a shower beforehand. I'd be a bit ashamed to leave this contextual bit of culture out of this, but this is common for those in Japan to do before having sex with someone. So, with all of this in mind, this leads us back to where we were a few moments ago with this point of view, specifically from Akio Atori, who appears to be looking down at a naked Ushina Tenjo, either in the middle of or having just completed the act of sex with her. her with her gaze constantly being made to avert his stare, but it keeps coming back to this forced POV at every turn. I repeat, Akio Atori. A man canonically meant to be in his late 20s or early 30s, who has been shown to regularly and violently assault his sister sexually on a weekly basis in this story, and is engaged to an 18-year-old high schooler in this story as well, has just had sex with a 14-year-old high school student, most likely without her even realizing what has happened, until it was too late to stop him. I will put this in the simplest form possible for what has happened here. Akio Tori has not only likely performed sex under false pretenses with Utena, but he's also committed statutory rape under said deception. And as we have now established, this isn't the first time he's committed such heinous acts in this story. I could easily stop this section of the retrospective off here and just go on to something better to break the tension, but I think at this point we need to have seriously addressed the situation at hand here. Akio Tori is a horrible man. By this point in the series, this shouldn't exactly be a shock given what we've come to realize and what we've seen him do until this point. But in this one scene alone, he's not only established himself as not just the villain of this series, but he's established himself as a manifestation of not just the patriarchy in the world of Rutana, but the worst kind of human being that can exist in the real world as well. When doing research for this series, I stumbled upon a particular quote from a user on the Ushina subreddit that basically explained in the most simplest form the entire manifesto of Akio Watori as the villain of Revolutionary Girl Utena. In the show, he is one of the most disturbing villains I've ever come across, because his evil is so real. There are people just like him in real life. The unreality of the show actually makes his perfectly normal evil hit harder, I think. He's not a comic book villain with grandiose plans of instant genocide. He's just a charming dude who uses his power to abuse everyone around him, and to groom the children he is supposed to be caring for before raping them repeatedly. 
And that really did hit home for me on this rewatch, not just for what Akio Otori represents, but also for what kind of a person he is. Because Akio Watori isn't just a manifestation of how twisted the patriarchy is, not just in the world of revolutionary girl Utena, but in our own as well, and how it manages to corrupt all feminine people in the world into specific, very submissive roles. But he's also a textbook example of the kind of person in our world who could not only easily perform such acts without a second thought, but also how such a person can do them and then get away with them so easily. A famous example to the public consciousness I feel in the last decade is the case of Brock Turner, who for those of you who may not remember or know much of it, was a case where a scholarship student at Stanford University in 2015 was tried and convicted of date raping several women and got caught dumping one of them into the trash bin the same night. And while he was convicted for six months in prison and is now on a sex offender registry, he got released early and to many people's knowledge goes by a different name now to try and escape his unknown past as a sex offender. So while he did get caught and was fairly tried, he was still let go in some level of privilege given his status and his influence, and while that state may follow him forever, he seems to have no problem with trying to avoid it. Akiwatori is a very similar case in this regard, except it's on a much, much worse scale. Because Akiwatori is an archetype of the person who can do all of that and not get caught. Akiwatori is the kind of person you meet on a dating website, thinking you've found the perfect match, but when you begin talking to them, they seem a bit off, and you're unsure what's going on. Then you begin to feel a bit queasy, and the next thing you know, everything's a blur, and you're waking up in a hotel room with the person you were at a bar with, and your body feels much more intense than it did hours before. You feel ashamed, but he feels nothing, but the satisfaction of what he's done. Almost cold enough that he's done this over and over before. Akio Otori is the kind of person who you meet online one day as an impressionable young teenager, not having learned any lessons about talking to strangers on the internet and believing what they tell you. This person will make you feel like you're the most important person to them, make you feel safe enough to let your boundaries down, and then, one day without you knowing, the person stops talking after you let yourself down enough to show them something that you shouldn't be showing to people at such a young age, and then never messages you again. Akio Tori is the kind of person that you, who you hear your best friend in high school talk about as being a loving and devoted boyfriend. Someone who on the surface seems to be so adoring to your friend that you think they're the best person for them. And then one Monday morning, you notice that friend hasn't come to school. And then the next day, and the next day, and the day after that. Until one day, she does come back. But when she does, her demeanor has changed so much, it's like she's a different person entirely. She doesn't want to talk, and whenever you look at her, it's like the light has left her eyes fully. And you then realize what has happened to them. Akio Atori isn't just a monster. He isn't just a construct of negative patriarchal stereotypes. He's not even an example of how horrid some men can be in this world. Akio Atori is a bastard, and episode 33 of Utena not just cements this as his position in the cast, but it's outright the moment in which we realize that whomever Akio Atori really is, if he's Utena's prince truly, then the prince she had followed for so long ago has truly been lost. And whatever remains is a horrible, corrupted bastard of a being whose crimes seemingly have no end point, and Utena is just another act of conquest to make his in the most disgustingly real way possible. I think we need to take a break from this for the moment, if only to just simply try and process a bit more about what has happened, but also to try and simply mentally prepare ourselves for what's to come. 
So let's say we try and revisit that pin board after so long. Okay, so, it's been a while since this thing has come out, hasn't it? And we have a lot of new faces on the board to address, and some to readdress. Let's start off with the ones we already have on, we've already mentioned previously. She and him, for Shio, for Juri, have now been revealed as Shiori and Ruka, and their whole dynamic has completely changed given what we saw in the mini-arc with Ruka involved. Because with information from the Black Rose Saga, we now know that Shiori has a lot of resentment for Juri in the same manner that Juri has in return, and now they're both being manipulated forever by Ruka, which sparked their whole conflict this arc. So this whole mess of a... Well, it's not a love triangle, but you can probably make sense about what that could be. Has turned into a mess of manipulation which can be compared to an Ouroboros. And with the new faces to add on here, we have Aki Otori, Kanae Otori, Soji Mikage, Mamiya, and Keiko, right over here. As with the previously mentioned, you can see we've already updated it based upon what we know from the Black Rose Saga previously, which is that Mikage and Mamiya have a shared history from the time a century before the series story takes place, and Akio and Anfi are siblings, and Kanai and Akio are engaged to be married. Kanai and Anfi don't really get along that well, and Keiko and Nanami have this weird power dynamic due to Nanami's relationship to their whole group. Speaking of Nanami, however, I did forget to mention Nanami and Mitsuru's relationship as being a one-sided crush on Mitsuru's part, which is used by Nanami to keep him in place as another servant akin to Keiko. Uh, which really hasn't aged that well given what we saw in the Black Rose Saga. And I'd be a bit ashamed if I didn't mention Wakaba and Sayonji's relationship together. And then swiftly cut them because of Wakaba's feelings being trampled on in the Black Rose Saga. So now that we've made this whole mess a lot more worse than it was before, let's get even more crazier with what we know now. So it's been made painfully obvious that End of the World and that End of the World and the Prince and Akio Otori are all connected by now. Alongside that, it now means that we need to make a direct line from Utena to Akio, as their relationship has become more majorly complicated beyond words. I'm going to call this relationship twice fold trauma Idris Grubig, because to call it anything else would be a disservice to Akio's crimes. Speaking of Akio, however, him and Turga have a weird relationship going on, as while he's working alongside Akio as End of the World, it's clear he's got a conflict of interest for what Akio is doing and Utena moving forward, and, spoiler alert, he will have his own agenda with said conflict going on into the next part of this saga. So I'm gonna- so for Akio and Turga, I'm gonna call this subordinate cuckolding with a side of sexual tension. And as an update on Turga and Sayonji's relationship, they've got a strayed friendship to rivals who are fighting for a greater good in this saga. More on that in a bit. And an update for Utada and Wakaba. Ironically, they now have the strayed friendship moniker on their relationship chart here, while Utada and Anfi's relationship over here has grown from the hero duo dynamic with sexual tension to probably actually just a full on couple by this point who happen to be heroes. Nanami and Turga, on the other hand, well, let's just say whatever feelings Nanami had for Turga before he, before her double up episodes we talked about before, they're kind of torch. So I think we can successfully cut this relationship here. Turga and Utena, however, it's less of a power play now on Turga's end, and more of a situation where he's fully aware of the situation at hand with her, and is now actively wanting to be her prince and maybe falling in love with her. So it's less pre-romantic gaslighting and more accidental infatuation of your enemy. People on Archive of Our Own know exactly what I mean by this. Oh yeah, not only that, and there's the fact that Bobby of the Present and Amphi are implied to just be one another during the Black Rose Saga, so there's that little connection right there. Not only that, but Mick but Mickey and Jury don't really care for the schemes of End of the World by this point, so they are just like, so they are just cut from the connection 
all together by this point through to end of the world. They do have a, they do however have a better relationship with Utena moving forward now as they begin to cheer her on against the schemes of end of the world. And once more with feeling, everyone except for Nanami is connected to Otori Academy over here because it is a hellscape for which they cannot leave. And if you're confused on what I mean by that, don't worry, we'll be revisiting that line of thought later on once we finish up the series itself. But for now, I want you to look, I want you to take in this mess of a board, everyone at home. This is the final result of the complex character narratives of Utena, a jumbled mess of relationships that started off slightly bad, but grew to such a complicated mess that, well, you can see it for yourself. Though I swear to God, if I get any- Um, actually, why haven't you put Shigusa, the MC from the Saturn game, into here if they're a part of a Tori 2 people in the comments? I may very well throw a fit, because do you know how hard that would be to do? I have been asked to keep my tangents and rants down to a minimum due to how much we have to cover this part, and considering we're that long into this video, and considering we have a lot more to go through, I guess I can see where they're coming from. That being said, let's move on to the episode which kicks off the final stretch of the Ushina series, episode 34, The Rose Crest. Now, fun fact real quick about this episode before we dive into this. This episode was actually storyboarded by Junichi Sato. You may be asking why this is so important to bring up by this point, but here's the funny thing about it. See, Junichi Sato actually directed the first season and first 13 episodes of season 2 of Sailor Moon prior to Ikuhara taking over for the latter half of season 2 and seasons 3 and 4 before starting on Utena and Takuya Igarashi took over for Super S. Remember Igarashi-san, by the way, we'll be coming back to him later on. Sato, however, has gone on to work on such series such as Aria the Animation, Ojimajo Doremi, Princess Tutu, and arguably the biggest curveball, the first season of Five Brain Puzzle of God. But he's, but he's linked directly to being the predecessor for Ikuhara in the director role for the series that made Ikuhara who he is now was arguably one of the biggest things for his career in the long term. So while it's hard to confirm that this is basically a thank you gesture from Ikuhara to Sato, it's argued that it could essentially be some level of mutual respect between the two peers. Now, getting to the episode itself, it follows along with the immediate aftermath of the actions done between Uta and Akio in episode 33, while also reaffirming to the audience the horribleness of Akio and Tori as we begin the episode with the two having finished up the deed for the evening, all the while Uta sleeps by herself. The very next day, however, Uta is being asked by two girls from Atori's theater group to become part of their latest stage production, stating about how amazing of an actor Utena would be, trying to lead her along by inviting her to a play the very next day, with their troupe name, the Kashira Players, being a reference to the Shadowplay girls previously mentioning themselves as aliens from the planet Kashira. Wait, hold on a minute. Oh god, I haven't talked about the Shadowplay girls yet, have I? Okay. Brief tangent, I swear I'll be quick. The Shadowplay girls have been present as a kind of Greek chorus for the story of Utena, showing up before the duels begin in each episode of the series with their own little bits serving as obtuse metaphors for the events taking place in each episode at a given period of time, and add an additional layer to the story as a result, despite how they become very inane as well. They were also additionally the same ones who confirmed Ruka's passing in his mini-arc. Their silhouettes taking form to confirm the jury and the audience of his absence being caused by that. With their first physical manifestation in this, implying they may be more than just another odd piece around Atori Academy, and they may know more about what's been happening than anyone else. This later gets looked into as Utena attends the theater show the next day, with Anfi and Akio in tow as well, to their play titled, The Tale of the Rose. And strap yourselves in, everyone at home, because believe it or not, this is where things start to both make sense, but become the hardest parts to keep track of in terms of the Utena story, as the biggest revelation yet is about to be given to us in the audience. The truth from Utena's past, 
and Envy's nature as the Rose Bride. As the Shadowplay girls talk about, the origins of the Rose Bride date back to a time when all girls were princesses. When there wasn't yet a bride, but a Rose Prince who was constantly set to slay down all the evil in the world. Including a horde Godzilla for some reason. Yes, it was the Rose Prince who was the one who protected the world from darkness, with the implication being that this was Dios who did all these deeds, all until word of a witch coming to steal his light that protects the world from him, saying that she will come from a castle in the sky, not too dissimilar to the one in the dueling arena, to take it from him. What is the light they are talking about? Well, with flashes from the members of the student council, they say it is something eternal, that shines, the power of miracles, before calling it the power of revolution itself, indicating the light itself is the same power that Usha has been able to take hold of this entire time. And, as the tale says, the power of the light is trapped in the castle of eternity with the Rose Prince within it. With the witch who trapped in there in the castle being his little sister, implied that Amphi trapped in there to keep his power for himself, because as stated in the play, A girl who cannot become a princess is doomed to become a witch! <laughs> plunging the world into darkness. However, this is only one side of the story. The story of which the world has told of the fate of the Rose Prince for so very long. And it's fortunately a fake story despite the little sister in question by a patriarchal world. And the true story? Well, the true story is much more heartbreaking. This takes us back one final time to the night Utena was found by Serenji and Toga, as it was shown in the Student Council saga, but we now see the full events of that night in full as we look at the person who showed her something eternal, that being Dears. He comes to take her to see something eternal, that which being the sight of a young Anfi, called a witch by Dears, struggling in pain as she's unable to even die living on in agony as punishment for taking the prince away from the girls of the world. The truth of the story told beforehand being that Dears became ill, unable to fight for the princesses of the world, the men who demanded them to be saved coming to call for his aid, despite his injuries and pain, with a young Anfi begging for him not to do so, lest he die in the process. Anfi proceeds to then talk to the men demanding his help, stating that he no longer exists and belongs to her alone, stating that she sealed him away to ensure that they do not come any longer for his aid. And in an instance, the villagers turn their weapons on her, branding her a witch and impale her with all 1,000 of their weapons. Anfi's punishment isn't a punishment. It's her sacrifice to save the only family she had, and the world branded her demeaning words and harmed her for defying the patriarchal hierarchy of the world that they live in. Evie's eternal punishment as the Rose Bride is a continued aspect of this. And as a younger Utena looks on, she can't help but want to save her, even as Dears declares that the prince she once cared for has become end of the world, revealing the prince to truly be Akio Atori, with Utena being unable to do anything for her in this moment, pleading to Dears to help Anfi. And then, the moment which Utena canonizes the most important moment of her life, the promise with her prince comes to be seen, as it's revealed Dears cannot save her. Only a prince Amphi can believe in can save her, with Utena declaring she will become a prince instead. With the speech being given by Dears that she memorized being Utena told how to become the prince Amphi can believe in, being given the rose crest in this moment to bring her to Amphi eventually, the episode ending with Utena having dreamed remembering the moment in question, with Amphi only asking, But who are you, really? as if to make Utena realize the truth of her position in the world of Rotori finally, having hinted about this as far back as episode 25, when she said about Utena looking familiar to her. And with that, all the pieces of the puzzle of Utena's past are laid out before us. She was destined since meeting Anthe and declaring she'll become a prince to save her to be in this moment. Despite having forgotten about her past events in full detail, and seeing it only as a story she has told us until now. Utena and Anfi's meeting was no accident, it was by design. And if this is any indication, viewers, it seems as though Akio Atoria's end of the world has been waiting for her to become a prince, and keeping her from doing so as a distraction to make her a woman, instead of a prince. And with how things are progressing so far, it seems very likely he may be getting his way if Utena doesn't realize the truth sooner or later.
This then leads us into the second to last stage of the story of Utena, as the love that bloomed in wintertime serves as the prelude to an event which has been foretold for the last few episodes in passing, the final duel between Utena and Toga, with the implication being this will truly decide who wields the power to revolutionize the world. With Utena still reeling from the events of the last two episodes, she feels very much in and out of mental states during these episodes, akin to how she felt in the student council saga beforehand, but this time something much more important she isn't remembering isn't coming to her. But just as she appears to be getting close to figuring out the truth, so does Akio interrupt the proceedings as if on cue to continue his manipulation of events. However, in the background of these events, Toga begins to question Akio's true motives behind what is transpiring, and while being used by Akio to try and dissuade and distract and dissuade her from the duel using his playboy charms, his true emotions begin to emerge for Utena behind his need to manipulate her. However, in his own unfortunate way, his attempts to try and keep her from falling into Akio's charms leads her directly to him ironic as it may be given the initial plan at hand. And while we are to believe at the moment that Toga was simply trying to gain Utena for his own purposes, the truth ends up becoming more and more twisted as Toga reveals that he truly does care for Utena, despite Sayuji's mention that he simply uses people for his own gain. This paired with a conversation with Akio in relation to the events that indicate he is wavering in his dedication to pushing Utena into Akio's arms as his princess, Toga begins to believe he must win the duel for another reason, to save Utena from Akio and make her his. This paired with a later conversation between Sayonji at the end of the episode in the student council room that makes mentions of Utena alongside those that sprawl the halls of Atori Academy, being trapped within their own coffins and remaining children as a result. Which the Men of War is doubled down on with Sayonji and Toga turning into their younger selves after the fact, leaves a lot of theories about the nature of Atori Academy being similar to a purgatory state. But I'll leave that for now as we'll revisit that another time! However, as Utena begins to slightly see moments from when she was younger flash before her with Anthe, it's clear as day that Utena's point of no return is closer than we think. And it's in the following episode, and thus opens the doorway of night, that we see this point of no return be crossed and then some, as the build-up of the story that has remained in place since Toga's first appearance to Utena in episode 3 comes to bear fruit finally, and the playboy prince makes his last stand against the corrupted prince. It's shown in this episode that Utena is slowly becoming less and less of a prince, to the point that those around her are slowly beginning to notice that she's becoming less a prince and more a princess, stating that a revolution is slowly happening within the school, whether this is for Utena or Akira's gain has yet to be seen. Toga, having committed himself to dueling Utena one more time, Sayonji, however, convinces Toga to admit that he's doing this for his own gain, and not for the sake of Akio's end of the world, finally admitting his desire to try and keep her away from him at any cost. To this end, he meets with Utena the day before they are slated to duel, with Toga taking her to the dueling arena at night in order to convince her to pry herself away from Akio's clutches and fall for him instead in arguably the most genuine way he has by this point in time. Utena surprisingly gives in to this desire of Toga, but her conviction to both wavers even further as a result. And so, the stage is set. It's one final duel between Utena and Toga with Utena's desire to save Anfi from her fate and, unknowingly, end up the world in Akio, against Toga who wishes to save Utena alone from Akio's grasp for his selfish love for Utena. This crushes Utena's believed idea for Toga that she had believed he was to be true as a prince to her. The penultimate duel to the side who will revolutionize the world is at hand. With the added caveat of Utena winning meaning the student council will never again come for Anfi, Utena is steadfast to ensure Toga doesn't win this final duel between them, and with Sirenji at his side against Utena and Anfi, the two draw their swords and clash one last time. The song played in the background of this duel, Allegory, Allegory, or Allegoryist, is the perfect microcosm of the entire events of the Apocalypse Saga leading up until this point. As the lyrics talk about prophecies of destruction and frightening and strange tales, make it clear that this song isn't just about Toga or Utena, but all of Atori Academy as a result. 
The duel itself is one of the longest in the series, clocking it in a total of nearly three minutes from bell to bell. It is not spared any expense to make it perfectly clear of its importance, as Utena and Turga fight primarily in the surrounding arena made by cars similar to Akio's. With Turga not only using his princely demeanor to mentally harm Utena like in their first duel, but to try and dissuade her at the last minute from falling further into Akio's schemes with their actions in the duel being some of the most unique of the entire series itself. The only thing that ends the duel, not being Deus Ex Machina like previous attempts, but the power of the Rose Bride itself that Turga had showed off previously in their second duel, as Utena slices the cars ramming into them with her power before taking down Toga, as he and Sayoji ram Jouster style into them, with Utena dealing the blow to end the duel and ensure the student castle will not meddle in their affairs any further. Toga pleads with Utena in this moment if she is the one to revolutionize the world to be wary a friend of the world and the Rose Bride along with him, to which Utena seems to be unable to grasp it as anything more than desperation until the bitter end. Toga and Sayonji questioning their place now after this, stating it won't be over for them until they see the very end. And, almost as if on cue, finally having stopped the student council from coming after Anthe and the opposition having been stopped, does Utena realize the awful truth of the situation at hand for herself? As she sees Anthe and Akio in the middle of their deed, Anthe blankly staring into Utena's soul, as if to plead for her to reconcile what is happening and what her fate truly is. Which leads us into the final lead up of the inevitable duel with Akio Atori, episode 37 The One to Revolutionize the World. Acting as one final breather episode before the climactic duel with Akio is set, it sees Utena be at her most conflicted and arguably her most unsure to the fate she wishes to be a part of, now knowing full well the extent of her past with Anfi and Akio. And even despite all of that, Utena continues to lead herself along into the arms of Akio, despite Anfi's continued attempts to keep her from doing so, all while the student council are given one last goodbye letter from End of the World signifying the end of them for the as the antagonist against Utena under his control. While Utena has a letter awaiting her, but with Utena's continued wavering resolve, it seems like the power of revolution will remain sealed. This coupled together with Utena becoming more and more feminine presenting in this episode, with her dressing in something more gender conforming with Akio, seems to give the idea that Akio is under the world has stopped Utena Tenjo from realizing the power of revolution and is given in to become a princess for him instead of a prince for Anfi. However, the remaining members of the student council that haven't seemingly sided with Akio when Juri, Mickey, and later Nanami come to try and convince Utena to proceed through the Rose Gate one last time to face off against Akio and truly revolutionize the world, finally admitting their own selfish desires when they were a part of the council. Nanami even outright calls out Utena and tells her she's being tricked against Akio by playing into his romantic escapades, with the two of them finally coming to some level of understanding with each other right before the end. Hell, the entire student council that meets with Utena ends up coming to one final understanding with Utena in an attempt to cheer her on finally against the forces that have kept them in this hellscape known as Atori. This is then followed up by one moment in particular, which sees both Utena and Anfi sharing some biscuits and tea, with Anfi admitting that she put poison and such as Cantarella into the biscuits, with Utena saying she poisoned the tea, with them both still admitting that they are delicious and wanting to do this in the next 10 years with each one another is all said and done. This is then followed up by, abruptly, another content warning here, Anfi going through an attempt on her own life, with Utena saving her at the last minute, a despondent Anfi begging for her to let her go instead of continuing on with the sick game of the Rose Bride believing until Utena came into her life that she doesn't deserve anything more than the abuse and pain that comes with the role. And it's this moment that ends the episode, coupled with everything else that has happened since the Student Council Saga, which leads us to the apex of Utena's journey throughout this series. As has been made mentioned before, Utena's continued journey since the Student Council saga, with her coming to her own as the protector of the Rose Bride and Anthe, was no such accident. In one way or another, th her continued journey throughout the Black Rose and Apocalypse saga up until this point is one of her conviction being tested as well as being made to see the uncomfortable truth of the world 
as well as her past. In one way or another, her continued journey throughout the Black Rose Saga and the Apocalypse Saga up until this point is one of her conviction being tested, as well as being made to see the uncomfortable truth of the world and her past. Much like how we saw Utena's ideals of a prince being tested to its highest degree through Toga's act in the Student Council Saga, we've seen Utena be tested not just as a duelist, but as a friend and as the protector of Anfi throughout these last two sagas until now. With the Black Rose Saga testing her resolve to those around her in Wakaba, and those linked to other members of the Student Council like Kozue, Shiori, Mitsuru, and Keiko, it also has the important distinction of Utena having faced someone whose desires were plain and clear, but ultimately unobtainable. And while one can make the argument that is, in essence, the entire point of the Black Rose Duelist motivations, I want you all to keep that in mind with Utena's overall journey, as we're going to revisit that idea in a moment. But with looking at the events of the Apocalypse Saga until now, it's clear to see that there's a similar vibe to how things played out for Utena and the Student Council Saga. And no, it's not just down to her having to redo everyone in the student council with their very early attitudes coming back in that same saga. It's in how Utena has been manipulated by a prince-type character in the same way that she was slowly manipulated by Toga in the student council saga, to slowly show the cracks in her armor of her being a prince in her own right. Except where Toga failed to fully degrade her and torture her manifesto, which only spurred on Utena to regain Envy and affirm her status as a prince, Akio has managed to worm his way into Utena's mind by slowly but surely feeding her the same fantasy that she had made mention to him over time. But it wasn't just that. Utena's grooming by Akio had been taking place the entire Black Rose saga, as during each of the episodes of the saga, she's seen talking to Akio about various different topics, with some of the highlights being a discussion over child versus adult mindsets, in which Utena feels unsure about which one she would be in a situation like that, as well as a mention of Utena being innocent and pure compared to the others, but saying that some innocence can hurt people, which comes shortly after Jurik called Utena unintentionally cruel like Shuri was in that same arc. The implication being that Utena's innocence to the matter has been a matter of cruelty, that even she may not understand by this point, a matter in which Mikage points out to Utena by calling them not so different, with Utena's ignorance and the truth staring at her in the face is akin to that of Mikage's actions that led to his scheme. And as much as Utena punching and dueling him out of existence was her trying to revolt against that idea of them being similar, he wasn't exactly wrong with her ignorance hurting those around her, and when her and Amphi start suddenly started living together as per Akio's wishes, it's made clear that by this moment is what solidified Akio's motivations to make his plot manifest. This, however, means, as Akio is worming his way into Utena's heart and Utena by proxy is giving in to her desires as a woman, instead of being steadfast and true like we saw with her promise to become a prince to save Amphi from her fate as revealed in the true story of their backgrounds in episode 34, that Utena giving in to Akio slowly is hurting Anfi by proxy with her ignorance. And for as much as Utena claims with words to Anfi that she is as important a friend as that can come for her to anything like she's made clear throughout this saga so far, her actions in giving in and becoming more of a princess than a prince with Akio's advances and other actions makes it clear that it's ringing hollow and she needs to figure out which one she's going to be before it's too late. Because Akio has managed to do the one thing that Toga failed to do as a false prince to Utena, make her become more feminine and accept her role in society as his princess and stop the idea of her being a prince from coming true. Because if he can do that and take the Rose Bride from her prince that she believes in with Utena, then much like how it was foreshadowed in Toga Shilwet in the Student Council Saga, Akio will have both the Prince and the Rose Bride under his thumb, and Utena slowly realizes this, admitting in the worst ways possible with her seeing Envy and pain after another assault from Akio, which pushes her to make a choice over what she wants to protect more, her new love, or the Rose Bride she promised to save years ago. Hence when Utena steps forward to end episode 37, and Toga simply asks if it's for Envy's sake, and the retort by him to say is that whoever is devoted to true friendship is a gullible fool. Usha not only responds by saying, <laughs> Didn't you know? I am a fool. Before walking away to meet Anfi. And while Anfi herself gives Utena one final chance to stop herself, as if telling her there is no turning back once I step through into the arena for the final time, 
All Utena does is flash her rose seal, the seal given to promise herself she'd become the prince Ambi could trust to save her from her fate. To assure Ambi she knows what she must do, in spite her uncertainty previously, has no further reservations over what comes next. Despite what happens next, Utena's story in one way or another has concluded with this moment. As she's faced the struggles of temptation when it comes to her role as a woman in heteronormative society twice fold, and actualized her role both as her own person and a promised savior, faced the darkest parts of those around her, and even faced the truth when it comes to her past. It has all come down to this moment for Usuna, the reunion with her prince, and the chance to finally save the tortured Rose Bride and Anthe. The only questions that now remain are, can Utena defeat her prince, and can she save Anthe? These questions all come to a head in the penultimate episode of the main Utena story, episode 38, End of the World. As the first image of the episode being the final usage of Zum implies, this entire episode is a duel, pitting Utena in a much different dueling arena against the final boss of Atori Academy, End of the World, Akio Atori. And with Utena finally coming to terms with the fact that the man who she had fallen head over heels with is the same person who plotted the events of, La of her time at Atori Academy from beginning to end, even after he attempts to coerce her one last time into being his princess, including changing Utena into a Rosebride outfit to make this point clear, Utena, even after everything, refuses to allow Anthe's fate to remain as the Rosebride. Even despite Anthe's pleas the night before, she wasn't meant to get swept up into his position, saying she took advantage of Utena's innocence for her own gain, with Utena admitting her ignorance ego as a result, as a part of it. Even when given an offer to run from this, declares she cannot allow this to be their fate. Takes the sword from Akio and prepares to fight him one last time. <sighs> However, before she can begin the duel against End of the World, Akio pulls back the curtain one last time to reveal something of which is the biggest shock of the entire series. The entire dueling arena itself is just the planetarium in the, in the Chancellor's house, meaning every single time Utena has dueled in the arena, Akio has been present in some manner every single time in hiding. In this move, he not only reveals that the entire dueling arena itself is an illusion, but also the ideals of the prince alongside it, fully proving that his corruption as the Rose Prince into End of the World has become rotten to its very core, and whatever remains is not the same prince that spurred Utena on years ago. To this end, Akio even attempts to dispel Utena's guise as the prince for Anthe by showing every event that they have done in this saga together, as if to give a big gotcha moment to Utena for declaring that Akio's assault on Anthe isn't so bad when she's been going after him, despite having a fiancé and declaring because she doesn't understand Anthe, she can't save her. And as he states that Anthe enjoys being in this state and cannot live any other way, Pulling a blackened sword of Dios from her chest as a mirror to Utena's pure sword of Dios, all five of the steering council members meet to see the proceedings of how this will play out, and the duel known as Revolution finally begins. Final duel theme in the series, Internal Clock Municipal Ori soundtracks the back half of this duel, which, make no mistake, is the longest duel of the series and for good reason. Fitting for the final boss of Atori Academy and Akio's End of the World, this song is in essence the one-winged angel of Utena, as its ominous language presented throughout is in actuality referring squarely to the centuries of age that Akio has done not just as the Rose Prince Dios, but also his rot as he has become end of the world and engaged in cruel deeds all in the name of controlling his sister, the Rose Bride and Witch to the World, Anthe, as well as cruelly leading those around him to find something eternal of which does not exist. This duel between Akio and Utena isn't as flashy, brash, and it isn't what we've grown accustomed to at any point during this series. It's minimalistic and focuses squarely on the duel of ideals between Utena's innocence and desire to save Anthe from her fate as promised years ago, versus Akio's control over Anthe and continuing control over those around him, primarily women, to his own desires. The arena they duel in changes multiple times to the different dueling arenas shown throughout the series, like the differing stages of duels themselves as much as it is a flash between each and every battle that has taken place throughout this series. And as Akio continues to say to Utena that Anthe's choice of being the Rose Bride is of her own free will, Utena denounces that notion and declares one final time that she will become a prince for 
for Amphi. The statue of Dios's grave and the castle of eternity itself shattering at this notion, as if to symbolically agree with her that she will be Amphi's savior. However, as Ushin makes one final lunge and the final strikes are made towards Akira, he shoves Amphi in as a human shield. Symbolism at its finest, Ushina prepares to go in for the kill. Amphi clutches herself to Ushina, and with one final look, stabs Ushina through the chest with Akira's own sword, sending her own prince collapsing into the ground, with Ushina only asking why Amphi has done such a deed. Episode 39, and someday, together, we'll shine, begins immediately following the events from the episode prior, with Anfi answering Ushina's plea of why she has done this simply by stating she reminds her of Dears when she loved him, but in a cold, almost forced tone tells her that she can never be her prince because of her being a girl. Meanwhile, as they await the results of Utena as their representative, the council all remind themselves that they need to remain duelists until the affair is over, with them wondering if they could ever forget what has happened no matter which revolution ends up winning by the end, with Juri even talking about forgetting the name of someone who saved her and her sister and was drowned. Remember this for later on. Back in the arena, Anfi is shown regret over what she has done, reverts back to being the submissive Rose Pride that she was at the start of this whole affair, handing Akira the Sword of Dears as he steps through the Rose Gate with it, noticing something about to happen as she is called to protect Akira from what is about to come, as Ujina tries to stop her from what is coming, being the scapegoat for all of man's hatred, spite, and harm, the witch that sealed Dears away. As 1,000 swords representing hate come from the bottom to stab Anfi Hall, as is her eternal punishment as the Rose Bride. Utena, seeing all of this happen to her continuously, continues to try and struggle to save Anfi despite the hurt that has happened as a continued result of the being stabbed. All the while, Akio continues to try and open the door using the Sword of Dears, and an illusion of Dears himself taunts Utena continuously, saying she should just give up. However, this is Ujina Tenger we're talking about here. Even against all odds, despite all the pain she has been through, she stands on her own feet, determined to save Anfi herself by force if she needs to, hobbles over to the Rose Gate, defiant until the end to give the middle finger to Akio, the corrupted prince and his patriarchal idea that nobody can wield the power of revolution, nor save Anfi, but a man. And in her defiance, she reaches the Rose Gate, pulls at the vines and the handles that keep it closed with all of her remaining strength, even as the thousand swords continue to strike Anthe, she declares the only time she was ever happy was with her, shedding one single tear for the Rose Bride. Suddenly, the swords stop in place. The Rose Gate has transformed into the same visual image from Ushina's past, with the same coffin from episode 10 that held Anthe in place of the door. Utena continuing to struggle opening it up with all of her might, even as her hands begin to blister and the swords shatter away, Anthe disappearing. Akio can only look on as the swords begin to circle around the arena, Utena opening up a crack to reveal Anthe Hememia. The true Anthe that was suffering this entire time, the one who was promised to be saved by Utena, is finally shown to us all. Anthe, at last, we meet. And as the dueling arena begins to collapse, the threat of the Swords of Hate looming over them, and Amphi stating Utena shouldn't save her and leave her, Utena remains vigilant until the very end and asks for Amphi to take her hand and after a long time contemplating and wondering if it's the right decision for her to do, Amphi goes to take her hand, only for the coffin to fall along with the arena. Utena being unable to free Anfi from her coffin in the, even in the end, declaring she couldn't be a prince after all, and asking for forgiveness as the 1,000 swords that would punish Anfi proceed to stab Utena in her place and destroy the remains of the arena, her sacrifice in Anfi's place being a rejection by the dual system in Akira's world that he created, and the effects by what she did by opening up the coffin may not even be realized by her. The very next scene shows the following events at Atori Academy, with life seemingly going on and people only mentioning Uta in passing as someone they looked up to, with people starting to slowly forget her and saying that it doesn't matter, with the belief being that her revolution never happened in the end. 
However, as we see scenes of the members of the cast that Usha has met, dueled or otherwise influenced, such as Kozue and Mickey playing piano together, with Mitsuri even working with Mickey on a job next semester, Toga and Sayoji being on better terms with Nanami making tea with them in the kendo room, Juri captaining the fencing club again, and Shiori taking part with as well with her in it, and finally Wakaba taking Uta's place on the first episode with her own new best friend in her place, it's clear a change has happened for the better in Atori Academy. And the final one is made clear when we are shown the chairman's residency one last time. Akio and his desk preparing new rose seal letters to begin the Rose Bride duels once more. But as Anthony places her glasses on the desk, it's clear that despite Akio's talks of no revolution happening, something has happened. But there's something more important happening in this moment alongside it, as while the series may have been titled after Utena, she wasn't necessarily our character of focus or even our true protagonist. That has always been Anthony Hemebia. <laughs> No, I'm not trying to swindle you or even jerk at this bit. I truly believe that Anthony Hamebia is the true protagonist and the character of focus in Revolutionary Girl Utena. As in every sense, the events of the series for both good and bad all seem to focus in one way or another around Anthony's continued struggle as the Rose Bride. Be it being seen as a witch by the world around her due to not allowing them deers when he was in pain, being abused for her power as part of the duels for her in this series, or being the damsel to be saved by Ushina, she has always been the focal point of this story. And while Ushina herself may in fact be the very major character that is seen and given growth throughout the series, it needs to be said that Anthe has had the most important growth from the very first time we see her in episode 1 as the helpless Rose Bride. Hell, even before that when she was the sister to the Rose Prince and punished eternally for her defiance against the world and her final exit point as she leaves the very constrained cycles of abuse that have kept her trapped for centuries, but not by a prince saving her, but of her own accord. For all the talk that was made at the beginning of the series that hinted at the nature of the Rose Bride, from her submissive nature under the thumb of Sayonji with him even saying in episode 25 that the Rose Bride has no will of her own, and later reversing the said role out of obedience when paired with Toga as the owner of the Rose Bride by calling her a bird in a cage, and even making her parrot whatever the one she is engaged with says, it's clear that Anthe has been trapped in a cycle of being used for her power as a result of being the Rose Bride for so long. It's what she fears beyond it that keeps her in that role during this period. Sayoji's quote all the way back in episode 6 being a clue to this where he says, No matter how you may be abused, you're always happy to be near the one you love. However, as the series goes on, she continues to have faith for Uta becoming more devoted as the prince that she can't believe in to stop any opposing force from her being used for their gain, that she truly begins to realize her place in the world, subtle hints of this being the mention of If it's for someone you love, how you feel about other people really doesn't matter. And later the conversation Uta has with her where she asks It's impossible for you to quit being the Rose Bride, isn't it, Anthe? Much like Ushina's chink in her armor when questioning her own place as being the prince, this would be the first moment that Anthe realizes she does n that she does have the power to leave the very system she's trapped in as the Rose Bride, but she can't do it alone, and she probably tried many times in the past and failed to do so if what Akio's plans with the Nebero Hall boys is any indication. And even in this very saga itself, Ushina's influence and promise to come to her for almost anything makes her blurt out the truth to Ushina too soon before it's time. Hesitating almost out of fear of what may happen if she did, only mentioning she had her own prince similar to Ushida's in the past, that being Ushida herself is shown later on. However, she has had to continue to be an accomplice reluctantly in Akira's schemes, as the continued abuse she's taken for centuries from him has taken its toll. Akira's metaphor of the stars belonging to nobody being a metaphor for his control over her. Continuing this by saying, Well, I'm not the one who makes you suffer. The world does. And this abuse is only forever solidified by her continued cyclical punishment of taking the swords of hate that call her a witch eternally, being a metaphor for her centuries of being seen as inhuman as the Rose Bride, but also as a manifestation of the misogyny and negativity that is derived towards all women, even as Anthe herself confirms this idea. In the end, all girls are Rose Brides in a way. Which leads us to the last moments. As Ushina remains steadfast in saving Anthe, she reverts back to her submissive role as Akira's witch until the end, believing that nothing could save her, even the prince she had awaited for so long to save her, out of the same fear that has kept 
her trapped in the coffin for so long, the fear of what comes when she is free. Thus, while Ushina's sacrifice may not have been the thing that saves Amphi in the end by directly freeing her from her coffin, and therefore freeing her from Akio's control by her own hands, by taking the Swords of Hate in her place, Ushina has finally given Amphi the one thing she has never had until now. A choice in her own destiny. In fact, there's one quote on the matter that I found while sprawling out Reddit, and a user who watched this very episode plainly stated, Patriarchy can't be defeated by swordplay or dueling a manifestation of it to end it for good. You defeat it by removing toxic and abusive men from positions of power, and you shift the paradigms of the victims. They don't have to stay in those relationships. They can be free. And her choice. The one that shifts the paradigm after being given it to her by her prince after so long is to finally leave the coffin she was being kept in, leave the cycle of abuse that kept her under control of Akio, and remove Akio of his control and position of power, which is further symbolized by the flatline audio appearing as she states she has to go and walks away from him. Envy Hememia in that one moment did what many princes could not, stop Akio and enter the world in the Rosebride system, and free herself from her abusive cycle of control. And for all of that and more, Envy Hememia is the true main character of revolutionary girl Utena. And as Envy states to Akio he can continue to stay in his coffin and play Prince, she leaves him and his games, declaring that Utena has only left his world, and that she still exists somewhere leaving Akio calling for her to return to him as the bells chime one last time, symbolizing Anfi's long cycle coming to an end. We then cut to Anfi, in different clothes from everyone around her, a suitcase in hand alongside Chu Chu, as the triumphant tone of Rose in release sends us off. She declares she's going to find Ushina somewhere outside the bounds of Atori Academy, asking for Ushina to wait for her to find her, as she takes her first steps outside of Atori Academy. The final image being a picture that they took with Akio some episodes prior showing them holding hands. With a promise that someday, together, they'll shine. And yet, while we finished off the mainline series of Ushina itself, already tracking a very long journey from beginning to end, would you believe that we have not yet finished this look into Utena in its entirety? Because while the anime is certainly the core part of the Utena mythos, we've still got a lot more to cover. For example, you know that manga that I mentioned all the way back in the beginning stages of this? Well, We've yet to look at that, now have we? So, as made mention before at the start, the manga for Utena written by Chiho Saito predates the Utena anime's debut for about a year. As it began publishing at Shogakukan's monthly shoujo in June 1996, with a chapter being released on a semi-regular schedule in it until its completion in 1998. The completed Tonkabon volumes as well being started in, in January of 1997, some three months before the anime's debut the same year, making this the first release of anything Usha related in the franchise's history. This version of the story, however, while it does hold some key moments from the anime we just read through, has some drastically different story beats throughout it that make it clear that while the main story was always there between the two versions, this one was very much intent on being more a typical shoujo story than a complete deconstruction. You may also be wondering why I have an oddly different version of the manga compared to the four volumes I have of this. Well, aside from mistakenly getting the wrong version printed in, in shoujo for this, it's also an example of the two different versions of the manga that are out there in the western market. You have the original shoujo print, which is the exact same as the Shogakukan monthly version that was released in Takamon volume back in Japan, reading traditionally from right to left. And then you have this weird atrocity, released by Anamerica Extra, which is weirdly larger than the original print, and reads right to left, with this white border covering everything. Can you tell I'm not a fan? But, to be honest, 
think I will take what I can get when trying to get it physically. Because while collecting this manga, it became clear that it being out of print for almost two decades has left it being land for the slaughter of the resale values for the series. Especially when it comes to the later volumes. Oh, oh, and don't even get me started on that re-release from 2017 that apparently could go for double what I purchased for all of these together on a good day. Fuck resellers, man. Anyway, point is, we have five volumes worth of content to look at with this, so let's dive into the world of Utena the Shoujo, I mean Utena the Manga. Okay, so the manga starts out very similarly to how the anime does. However, Utena is at a different school initially when she starts out and instead of being at Atori before transferring over. She has a known guardian instead of an ambiguous status of any guardian, period. And her design is a pink outfit instead of her usual black attire. However, you can't really notice that given the fact there's not really meant to be any colors, so it's plainly stated out because manga, and it's even noted at her original school for being a bit out there. The story has a lot more modern shoujo aspects and ambiguously placed in older times, with the reason Utena attends Otori being explained in a prologue that tells Utena's story behind going to Otori as being sent letters every year with a hidden message in them. After the prologue, which is a completely different thing entirely, it then covers the first two duels with Sayonji in Fs 1 and 2 of the anime, except Utena manages to get the sword of Dios from Sayonji and strikes him with it instead of just using a bamboo sword. Toga appearing to Utena much sooner than in the anime as well. The second duel with Sayonji takes place at the same time as the ball, however, with episodes 2 and 3 being melded together being a weird sensation, but it still works pretty well. The second volume, To Plant, has Sayonji's strike on Toga from episode 10 happening at the beginning of it, with Sayonji being suspended for two weeks instead of being outright expelled. One downer for the manga, however, Juri is implied to be straight at this one and potentially in love with Toga instead of being a lesbian. Ew. However, this is also where Toga's beginning of trying to manipulate Utena and the jury duel happen within quick succession of each other. Jury's arc in all of this as well is less centered on miracles and her past, but more on keeping Utena away from Toga because of her own love for her. Instead, Wakaba is more gay in this version, and even calls herself Utena's girlfriend during all of this as well, which I love personally. It's also revealed in this one Toga has a secret room in his residency that has a calendar predicting when each duel will take place. Weird choice, but okay. Kosuei's brother complex isn't even subtext, it's just literal text in this version with how absolutely in the forefront it is. And in this version, Miki is attracted to Utena romantically instead of wanting Envy as his bride. Miki and Utena are properly forced to duel instead of Miki being manipulated to doing so by Toga. And Toga's manipulating of Utena as her prince happens to end this part, which leads into the beginning of Volume 3 to Sprout, with the introduction of Akio happening side by side with Toga attempting to duel Utena. It also doubles as the reveal for where Envy goes and the introduction of the chairman well before its placement in the anime timeline. Utena actively makes Anfi make an effort towards making friends outside of Utena as they engage during this period, not before Toga's arc from episode 11 and 12 takes place here, instead of Wakaba inspiring Utena to continue on. Funnily enough, Akio as the prince inspires her to do so, giving her the signature black version of her uniform as well in the process, giving the black version of the uniform a bit more meaning in this version. In this version, however, Toga stakes and loses his claim as student council president in the rebatch, a scene is shown before said rebatch that basically has him running through the student council elevator speech in longer form. And after his defeat, Toga devotes himself to Utena as her follower and disbands the student council immediately after the fact, giving his warning from his final duel in the series after his loss. And immediately after that, Wakaba's dorm catches fire and Utena saves her! And the reveal of Akio as End of the World happens to end this volume as well, shortly after. Leading us into Volume 4, To Bud. With Akio's manipulation of Utena taking place here, as it goes hand in hand with Anfi being forced along with it. Toga's way of protecting Utena from Akio isn't by dueling her this time, but by making her fall in love with him proper, explaining his reasoning to her almost immediately. Toga then reveals Akio's end of the world to Utena after the fact to convince her to stop falling for Akio, despite Utena still being in love with him from when she was a child. 
Utena and Anthe actually kiss in this version and get quote-unquote married as part of the Rose Bride concept in the manga, but it makes Utena the Rose Bride for Akio instead. But not only that, but Anthe is also freed by Utena from her coffin in this version after Akio takes off to the Castle of Eternity. With the castle itself not being an illusion this time, but it's an actual castle that they can enter, with Akio then killing Deers and taking his power in a ring of his own before revealing himself as Deers truly to end the volume. In Volume 5 to Blossom, we learn the Rosebride curse for Anfi is due to saving Deers of light from being amalgamated into Akio, with Usa and Akio's climactic duel ending with her successfully becoming Anfi's prince, making her believe in Usa and Deers' ring going to her in the process to defeat Akio. However, Usa and Akio mortally wound each other, but Usa that I'm not making this up here, becomes a godlike being known as Kallax to erase them both from the world in order to stop Akio at the end of it. You can't make this shit up, people. The very thing that Ikuhara w did not want to have happen in his version happens in the manga. Afterwards, Anfi wears Utena's pink outfit falling along from the end of the duel, and actually still proceeds to go on and search for Utena herself, and does imply to find her in the end if the manga's ending is to be believed. So, that's good, right? Right? However, these weren't the only stories that were in each manga volume, to be honest, as they also had a bunch of side stories in Volume 2 onwards. At, at least one, however, Volume 5, I believe, has two of them at the end. I'll go through each one of them very quickly. So, Volume 2's is To Curry Favor, which is literally just the plot of Curried High Trip, minus Nanami's involvement, instead focusing on Choo Choo trying to undo it, with the exchange diary plot being tied in as, as Sairuji blackmailing Choo Choo into getting Ed Futuna to write in it, with Choo Choo being the one to write in it instead, which honestly makes a lot more sense to be honest as to how crass it ends up being. Volume Freeze is Campus X-Files, Free Wishes, is with a plot involving Choo Choo finding a doll that allows him to make free wishes, the first one of which he uses to get a lot of bananas, cause monkey! The other that shrinks down everyone to Choo Choo's size when he wanted to be as big as everyone else, and finally, wishing everyone back to the proper size, which ends up making everyone bigger, including Sayerji, who who's a giant by the end of it. Volume 5's is A Deep Azure Shatter, to takes the event of the Ruka subplot involving Juri, except without Shiori as a third party involved, treating it as a more traditional shoujo plot in involving the two instead of sexual tension melodrama in Ikuhara's version, with Utena and Juri dueling in, the f in fencing in this part of it, with Ruka's death being confirmed in the actual panels and the second one for Volume 5 being the Black Rose Seal being an abridged version of the Mikage and Mamiya plot in the Black Rose Saga, tacked on at the very end of this volume. It confirms the Black Rose as it has its own different set of duel rules, that if Anthe's duelist loses, Anthe dies. Mikage ends up trying to kill Anthe as a result of that, but Utena kills him instead, causing the Nemuro Hall to collapse, being the reasoning in this version why it's so run down by the end. All in all, Saito's version of Utena as a manga is certainly a choice in what direction it ended up taking. I'm not saying it's a bad version of, mind you, of the story of Utena. Hell, in some aspects, I made like some bits here and there more than the actual anime itself. But I could see why Ikuhara went for a different direction for the anime. It's not necessarily a case of one particular version being better over the other, since, to be honest, a case of which one is the more true story, we'll get to this later on, there are so many differing versions of the Ushida story out there now, that trying to even make one of them the primary version, and have all the others be splinters, is such a fool's errand. Which, speaking of different versions, it's time we get to the other different telling of the Ushina story. The one that arguably everyone has a fury or idea or what have you on. It's time we finally reach our adolescence. <laughs> So, Adolescence of Utena, or Revolutionary Girl Utena Adolescence Apocalypse, 
or just simply Revolutionary Girl Utena the movie, was released in Japanese cinemas in August 1999, a good year and a half following along from the original series' completion in 1997. This would not only be the arguable final work of the Utena franchise that is made by all members of the collective B-Papas, but it is also considered to be the final work by B-Papas in general, as any Utena related med media following along from adolescence would be made by differing members of the collective, but also the final one that the collective would make together in general. And you'd think that, looking at what we're seeing here, adolescence would be a simple 90 minute romp for us to talk about in depth. But you'd be wrong. Because not only do we have a movie to talk about here, we also have a single volume adaptation of the story with its own differing version of events present within it. As if we didn't have enough to go over already in the main course. But enough of my belly aching, let's get to talking about Adolescence of Utena, the movie version. But first, a look at the creative process behind the movie itself. After the wildfire success of Utena in both its manga in 1996 and its anime in 1997, 1998 was basically a quiet year for the collective known as B-Papas as they had nothing released the entirety of that year. But what everyone didn't realize at that time was that Ikuhara was planning on one final hurrah for the franchise they had made together, teaming up once more with JC Staff alongside Sega Enterprises, Movic, and King Records to establish what was known as the Revolutionary Girl Utena Movie Committee. And much like how they spent the majority of 1995 to 1996 working on the finer details of the Utena series, 1998 was spent ironing out the details to create Utena the Movie, with Ikuhara expressing a desire at the time to use this as a vehicle to tell the kinds of stories for Utena that they couldn't accomplish with the anime for TV, while making it its own standalone entity. Which, given the kinds of things that they did get away with in the main Utena story in the end, has to make one wonder what Ikuhara was planning for RGU the movie, but I think we'll only find out by digging deep into it ourselves. To start off, the story of Utena the movie takes us all the way back to the beginning of the original story, with Utena coming in as a new transfer student to Otori Academy and meeting with Wakaba for the first time. However, you may find quickly that there are a lot of different things happening for those who are just coming from the anime. For starters, the architecture of Atori Academy is a lot more... complex. Yes, complex is the word I'd use here, as the Academy itself seems to be its own living organism, constantly shifting around and moving of its own accord, unlike the very static Academy that we saw in the anime series, with its multiple layers giving the effect of a stage play or theater setup, as was pretty much the whole entire point of it as according to the production team. The second thing you'll notice is Uta's more... different look. Her hair being seen more shorter, and her, and her outfit being somehow even more masculine than her outfit in either main series iteration, with her outfit this time and its military-esque cap evoking vibes of an inverted Jodoro Kujo from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. This outfit, as well as Uta's entire redesign, is effectively f leading fully into the idea of Uta's ideology of being a prince, something of which isn't lost at all in this iteration, but it may evoke a sense of fully turning away from Uta as a character being into gender conformity, something of which was merely hinted at in previous iterations. However, the next big change comes with the introduction of the student council members, as we're introduced to Jury and Mickey dueling each other as part of the fencing club, with Jury even being dubbed the prince during this, and then suddenly being introduced to Toga, with Utena running after him in a hurry. This leads us to a much different looking, even somewhat more gothic looking, Rose Garden, as Utena has attempts to try and find Toga, who comments on it being years since they've last seen each other and bringing up a promise to go to a planetarium together, almost as if they've known each other long before this meeting compared to the other times. Save that for later. Following from this, Utena has given her rose crest ring this time around from a rose in the garden, and, follow and follows her way up to the larger floating garden which contains Amphi within it, her own redesign giving off a very distinct trait regarding it. As Amphi's status as the lone person of other in the entirety of Utena is now added with the Hinduism bindi on her forehead. This has two separate meanings behind it, one being that of an adornment of someone who is engaged, which would be the easiest one to look at given Amphi's eternal status as the one engaged as the Rose Bride to a duelist, but it also doubles as being a third eye in Hinduism. We'll come back to that second meaning later on as well. 
Either way, this meeting between Uta and Anthe is more high tense at the moment Uta pulls out her Rosecrest ring, Anthe instantly going for it to try and take it from Utena, as if she knows something Utena doesn't about it, not before Sionji enters the picture to have his mandatory duel to lose. Although he's certainly more of a creep in this version when he's engaged to Anthe if we're being honest. The duel goes how you would expect with the duel with Sayoji, but some things to note are the duel itself being more savage on the side of Sayoji, who really is distilled into his worst traits in this movie, as well as the way that Utena beats him being the, that she obtains the Sword of Dios by Ant from Anthe during this duel. Not before getting a kiss from Anthe, of course. And that's another big thing of this movie I should point out. That right there? That was a major thing that this movie takes advantage of from the word go, compared to the series itself, which left it more ambiguous than anything. We get the full package of seeing these two kiss a lot in this movie. But it's thanks to that kiss and the sword from it that Utena defeats Sayoji and wins Anthe as a Rose Pride. The events that follow going how you would expect, with Anthe moving in with Utena, alongside a quick glimpse of a picture of a younger Utena and Toga together that Utena looks at somewhat painfully at. However, that night, when Anthe comes into Utena's room, the two have a frank discussion about the power dynamics of a duelist and the one engaged as the Rose Bride. And then Anthe attempts to coerce Utena into sex with her against her wishes, but if an interesting turn of events for sure, but something to keep in mind for later. It's also in the following scene that we get, essentially, a different background for Shiori and an explanation for why Juri is called the Prince. Shiori had a prince of her own who attempted to save Juri from drowning that they, when they were younger. As a result, Shiori who was engaged to the prince who drowned is now forcing Juri to be made the prince eternally. Eagle Eye viewers may notice that this is eerily similar to the story that Juri told in the last episode of the main Utena series, declaring she couldn't remember who saved her. This time around, however, it could easily be implied to be a now-deceased Ruka, or maybe someone else. Following on from this, we get, a, we get the slight tease of the story of the Rose Prince and the story about how the world turned against Anthe for protecting him, told through a phone call by someone we could assume to be Akio or Dears. However, the difference here being the power of the Rose Prince actually comes from Anthe's own power this time around, implying she's the one with the control in this version of events. It's also during this do we get a very interesting piece of dialogue by Toga, stating that the reason his hair is long is because his father ordered it to be as he was sold to many different elderly men when he was a young boy. Which visually implies him to not only have been used by many different men in his life, some even looking like prototype designs of Akio from the original design brief of Utena, but the visual flashbacks also imply he was sexually assaulted by these men and would often run away from them at the first sign of being assaulted by them, and this would be a recurring thing for him as a young boy. I don't know if this makes Toga more fucked up or more sympathetic, but like, holy shit, Ikuhara. However, as Utena ends up following Anthe to her Rose Garden the following night, we get a confrontation between the two, which Utena declares Anthe to be the reason why Toga suddenly changed his demeanor, believing that their history and subsequent breakup was because of Anthe's influence, hearkening back to the idea of Anthe being the manifestation of misogynistic viewpoints in the world. But it's then followed up by one of the most iconic moments in this movie. As Anthe lets loose a flood of water into the Rose Garden, Utena awakens to the garden flooding, and the stars reflecting the pool of water and the two begin to dance with one another in the flooding garden tenderly, as it says to the song, Sometimes Love Is by Masami Okui. The song itself is considered somewhat of a love theme for Usa and Anthe, as the lyrics very much reflect the journey that the two will have not just in this movie, mentioning them the coming together once more, but the journey they've had the entire Utena series with its talk of the Rose being their destiny, and the promise of them coming together being a reflection of Utena's journey in the series coming to save Anfi from her fate. It's not just an iconic moment in this movie, it's arguably one of the more iconic moments in all of Utena, and it's a beautiful moment between the two that acts as the moment they come to an understanding in this movie compared to their moments of understanding in the series being more slowly built over time. It's then hit with a wild wham moment, as during a moment where Utena undresses for Anfi to be a model for her, it's revealed that there's a large-scale painting of Anfi painted nude, most likely being assaulted, in the chairman's office. 
With the framing of the scene where Anfi says she'll show Utena why she's wanted by so many people as a moment of horrors as Utena turns around to look at her. Before we smash cut right to the Shadowplay girls as radio hosts, showing off a scandalous video, initially showing a video featuring Choo Choo, Nanami, and the triplets as animals in a bit of comedy to offset the wildness. And then, finally showing us the scandalous video in question, with Akio in his normal charming manner alongside Kanai, before cutting to him drugging and proceeding to do the deeds on as he did in the original series, before we cut away to the duel between Juri and Utena, which had been built up between Toga and Shiori's manipulations to occur until this point. The duel between Juri and Utena in this movie, in my honest opinion, is probably the best duel the two ever have, as it smashes out the duel they have with the Student Council Saga by a mile, and while it lacks the emotional weight of the duel they have in Apocalypse, its climax pro honestly provides the biggest whammy to the story at large, as Drew believes that Utena is dueling for the love of Toga, to which Mickey only questions as to who Toga really is. We'll get back to this point in a bit, don't worry. Dearest Ex Machina finally comes into play as Utena effortlessly strikes at Juri's rose and beats her. But it's what happens next after this moment that changes the game of Utena and adolescence properly, as it's revealed that Akio is dead, his body having been dug up and Kanaya crying over his dead body and being discovered, it being revealed to having been poisoned by Anthe and fell to his death in this timeline in one of his attempts to try and assault Anthe. And, after following after Anfi into what appears to be Nemuru Memorial Hall and a confession booth, she meets Toga one more time. Questioning the power of miracles, he explains that the duel game in this world is made because there is no prince in the flesh in this world, and finally reveals to Utena that he is dead after attempting to save a girl, implied to be Juri, as a child. It's then, as Utena steps out from the confession elevator to the bridge holding the rose garden with Anfi inside of it, does Utena step forward past the rose gate and Anfi declare that she was her prince all along? Bearing in mind they've only known each other for a grand total of 72 hours, mind you! Utena then declares that they will leave Otori and see the outside walls for themselves. And then this happens! Utena gets pulled into a car wash that suddenly appears, and a version of Zub plays, and the next thing we know, Utena becomes... a car. <sighs> Guess we gotta talk about this, huh? Yes, Utena becomes a car in the final act of this movie, as so does Shiori as well, with the mean-to-death image of Shiori saying the phrase, Are you surprised? It's a big mistake to think you're the only one who can turn into a car. I'm a car now, too. Being shown to death online whenever someone ends up mentioning Utena, especially adolescents. But I think the question on everyone's lips when they see this image is simple. Why does she turn into a car? It's a metaphor for Utena being the vehicle that helps Anfi escape her prison at Atori Academy, except instead of being figurative about it through building up over time, they decided to be clever about it and just make Utena a literal vehicle. As in a car, yes. And much like how Akio says in his delirium, a car without his key is stuck and begins to rust. So before Utena can rust as a car, Anfi uses the key she finds in herself to hop in and drive the endless highway or in this case, at the Speedway, to escape a Tori finally. And what follows is... honestly one of the most amazing race scenes I've ever seen in anime. And yes, that includes all of Red Line and Initial D. As Usa and Anthe outrace several cars and tanks, the allegory being that they represent the 1,000 swords of hate from the original series to try and stop them from escaping the world of Atori. Yet despite the damage that Usa takes during this, it doesn't stop them from trying to outrace and outdo them in their attempt to leave the prison of Atori, as even with the likes of Drury, Mickey, and Sayoji even attempt to try and ensure that they make it out alive, driving in a car that is implied to be Wakaba, similar to how they support them in their escape, declaring that they will follow them eventually, implying that they may one day escape Atori themselves. However, their escape is blocked off by a large castle, the castle of eternity that has always been something nobody could pass through. This time, however, Anfi doesn't hesitate when given the chance to turn back to Otori, and she declares she will escape to the outside despite the odds, mirroring her journey in the main Utena series as Utena herself continues to keep, go keep her going and is revitalized by Anfi's resolve to escape. But the final roadblock comes in the form of a compressing set of tank tires that crushes the car, with Akio as Dios in the middle begging for them to return. However, much like the series, Anfi refuses and rushes past him despite the car's destruction to their freedom and their revolution, 
together. And as the movie ends, the two of them riding off into a seemingly apocalyptic world on what remains of the car, both of them nude, embracing and kissing each other as they ride off into the unknown to create their own roads in this world together. Did all of that make sense? Do you feel a little bit confused on what you had just experienced? Do you feel so ever so slightly like you're not sure what the fuck just happened? Well, would you be surprised at all to know that that's the experience when watching Adolescence of Utena? But, to put it simply, the movie isn't just an abbreviated version of the mainline series compacted into one 90-minute film. It has all the story beats that are important from the movie, but some bits of fluff they in there to keep the story fresh, and, of course, theory bait, material which we will talk about in a little while. That being said, however, does it work as something standalone like Ikuhara and company wanted it to? Mm, yes and no, if you ask me personally. Yes, in a sense that you can watch this movie without any kind of previous knowledge of the Utena series and still enjoy it as its own 90 minute movie interpretation of the story, it can absolutely work on its own merits. But in the sense that you can, the, but in the sense that it makes absolute sense of the complex themes that Utena has been championed for and used as the perfect distillation of what the story of RGU is meant to be, Absolutely no. As a companion piece to the series, however, on the same topics, yes, this can work as such. If I were trying to get people to watch Utena and get into it, this would in no way be the way to do it. This should mainly be watched by those who have a background history of Utena for the best level of enjoyment, and if you haven't watched the main series, I would not recommend this as a solo outing until you've at least seen the series once. Otherwise, the main series is how anyone should be recommended to watch Utena by default, and the movie as supplemental material only. Anything else is honestly the worst way anyone could be introduced to this series. So I guess that leaves us with what happens in this. So why does this get its own separate discussion point? Because believe it or not, this has its own little differences hiding within it compared to the movie. The first major change being that Toga is present well before the Rose Garden bit, as he's still presented as being a thriving force throughout Atori alongside that's revealed by Wakaba, Atori Academy has been aroused since 1910 and housed every grade, not just high schoolers. And instead of the student council being present, they are instead seen as princes by the school, and given differing uniforms compared to everyone else. This is leading everyone to believe that Usha herself is a prince because of her own differing outfit. After this, the story progresses on as it did in the movie until the moment where the dance would have been. Instead, there's a scene which delves deeper into the story of Toga and Utena in this universe, with Toga having comforted Utena in a similar way that she did in the main story when Utena's parents passed. With Utena and Anthe instead seeing the stars in the Rose Garden, alongside some very fucking dorky comments of seeing stars in their eyes, but we love it regardless. And during the following scenes where Anfi's picture is depicted, instead there are multiple pictures depicted of Anfi, with Anfi refusing Utena's claims of wanting to know the real her by declaring if she did, she wouldn't want to know her at all, believing only her actions to be the truth. Showing a much different Anfi in this version than in the movie, or even in the original series. And unlike in the movie, Utena duels Toga to ensure she understands what Anfi means by a action seeking the truth, with Utena defeating Toga by Dear Sex Machina and him disappearing shortly after. This being the moment that Utena rediscovers his death, this time at the manga being to save Utena instead of Juri. It then proceeds on as it did in the movie following along from this reveal, up until the moment where Akio's death is revealed, the moment being capped off by Utena declaring that the scar Anvi got from Akio assaulting her is a wound she cannot allow to fester by staying at a Tori, which once more breaks the cycle they're in and Utena de declares for them to make a run for it. And finally, instead of a car battle sequence, Akio acts as the final blockade to have them leave, alongside trying to drown Utena until Toga tells her to forget him. This being the thing that allows her to escape by moving on from her past grief, much like in the show itself. With the ending being Anfi denying Akio one final time, or Tori crumbling around them as they leave finally. The last scene depicting Utena and Anfi not in an apocalyptic world, but at the planetarium that was mentioned so much, finding their way out of a Tori and into a world of their own, together. It's not all that different, sure, but it's different enough to be a distinctly different version by Saito that it bears to be talked about in its own right alongside the movie. Not just as the more shoujo version of it, 
but also as being the version of the story which arguably shows off some aspects not as well communicated as the movie did. But it also makes for a perfect piece for theorizing some very interesting ideas behind the entire Utena series as a whole, alongside of the rest of what we've looked up to at this point. <laughs> So I've done a lot of will talk about this later and this will be looked into more later throughout a lot of not just this part but the entirety of this series up until now. And there's been a very big reason I've, why I've kept a lot of it secret or down low until now. It's because there's a lot of theories that have been brought about in recent years from the Utena fandom, some of which I feel personally are a bit interesting but some of which I feel arguably make the series as a whole a lot more fun to look back on with them in context. I'll mainly be covering three, maybe four, that I personally love the most or find the most plausible in this, but trust me when I say that there is a lot of ground to cover with the Furies of this show, and I urge you, if you're a fan, to go out and look at the multitude of them for yourself, or delve into it yourself and even create your own if you wish to. That being said, let's get this ball rolling with... Okay, so this is the theory I've basically been hinting at since the first part where I mentioned the Votori being a hellscape for which the characters cannot leave, and that the Ward of Votori Academy is actually just purgatory, and all of the characters are stuck there due to their own lingering regrets in life, and with themselves. It's mentioned a lot in the back half of the series, and hinted at with Toga and Sionji's talk of graduating and remaining a child, as well as their son turning into the same younger versions of themselves we saw at the beginning, imply that a Tori is a prison, or as Turga puts it, a coffin for the people within it, all of whom have regrets and cannot make it out until they confront them head on. And for those of you who may be a bit skeptical on this theory specifically, I get it. It's kind of a stretch given the fact that Nanami is shown to go to different areas of the world a lot, but if you notice how I ended up stating that Nanami is the only one not affected, this goes hand in hand with the idea pres presented in Adolescence, that Nanami is an anomaly and as such has that ability to leave of her own accord. But for those of you who still don't accept it, I want to bring up something to help this fury out a little bit. Did any of you listen to that 2022 weekend record, Dawn FM? Because the way that Dawn FM presents the idea of purgatory as being a place where people go because they cannot make it to heaven due to having unresolved grievances in the living world that they need to come to terms with before moving on in their afterlives, kind of struck a chord with me when it came to the concept of Purgatory and Utena being of a similar vein. The album deals with a narrator of the story, sung by The Weeknd, to be someone who has lived a life of debauchery and sings about his regrets in life, mainly pertaining to love lost and the trappings of the material world that he indulged in for so long, with the ending basically implying he has a long road ahead of he wishes to try and escape the purgatory he's trapped himself in due to his regrets. And I feel like that basically could be applied to the Purgatory Fury of Utena so goddamn much. Because who else would be easy enough to have a lot of lingering regrets than traumatized children and teenagers who have yet to fully let go of their regrets and move on into their next lives? Because as Jim Carrey mentions in Phantom Regret on that album, You gotta be heaven to see heaven. And that the only ones who truly leave of their own accord or are sent away are the ones who have no regrets left to keep them there, or they are ones who resolve said like regrets and leave of their own accord, that it only makes sense as to why Akio would want to keep Anthony trapped in purgatory with him, and why Utena suddenly disappeared after her sacrifice seemingly in vain to save Anthony. This one works in tandem with another fear I'm going to get into in a second, but the Time Loop Fury works especially well if you consider Adolescence a sequel movie instead of an alternate retelling of the story. But it also works well in tandem with the evidence presented by the story that the story of the Rose Bride has literally happened so many other times beforehand. So why would being trapped in a time loop in a Tory not be a viable idea either. This is one you buy into if you believe Akio as Dios can control more than just the physical surroundings of Atori, and his comments of the duel starting up again and fighting it via another prince aren't just examples of cycles of abuse. 
but also an example of how Akio has literally been keeping everyone in Atori trapped in a time loop forever to keep Amphi trapped in this same cycle. That a new prince does come along in each time loop and fails to save Amphi, therefore leaving her stuck in this loop. Especially given how everyone seems to forget about Ushina once she sacrifices herself, and some characters revert to their prior selves from the beginning during this as well. This also goes hand in hand with the idea that even after everything, Amphi still manages to find her way back to Rotorian adolescence. But this time she knows exactly what's happening, hence explaining her more abrasive behavior in nature when talking to Usuna, as well as her poisoning of Akira before she, he can take advantage of her. But there's also another way to interpret the other iterations of the Usuna story. Yes, I'm really about to pull a Usuna multiverse theory out of my hat, because how else can you explain four different retellings of the same story with wildly different aspects to all of them existing in the public consciousness, alongside of the idea of this happening before, because it did, just not in their world. See, each version of Utena tells the story in a mostly similar format, but ends up, for better or for worse, taking drastic turns in, in its plot depending on which version you indulge in. For example, in the anime, you have Toga being this manipulative asshole at the beginning who ends up becoming more and more of a sympathetic anti-hero who's fallen in love with Ursula and is trying to save from Akio's manipulation. Whereas in the manga version, he's basically the secondary male love interest next to Anfi and Akio to an extent, and isn't necessarily a manipulative dick as he's playing fully into the traffic man archetype that someone like him should be known for. And in adolescence, both in the anime and manga, he's basically a ghost haunting Ursula as her actual prince from her childhood in this version, leading her into a Tori and through the story in a way that led her through in the initial version. You see how one's character change and dynamic between three different iterations basically changes the entire story altogether? Now imagine that for almost all of the cast between three or four separate versions of Ursula, and you get where I'm coming from here with an Ursula multiverse theory. Because while that could easily be linked in with the idea of the story happens on a loop with some changes to it, it's also another thing when the entire landscape and the story of what happens in a Tori changes between each retelling, to the point you wonder if it's even possible for them to be readers and not just happening across different timelines with something different happening each run. But of course, even if you don't subscribe to either idea, this next one may be one that may blow your mind a little bit for all my psych majors out there. Now, this one was one I didn't come across until recently, but it honestly got me interested in it because the context of Amphi's trauma over centuries worth of abuse in story, and it also kind of intrigues me because it gives Amphi a different dimension to her character because it's implied her and Akira slash Dios are actually related and therefore have the same powers of manipulation. So going off that line of logic, what if after so long of trying to wait for a failed prince to set her free, and being a pawn in an ever-expanding game which she has no control over, does Amphi decide to bring about some level of agency for herself by creating a manifestation of what she deems as her own prince to save her in the same way Akira's manipulated all of Atori Academy to his whims? This works on the level of Utena being a manifestation of Amphi's trauma and how, even when being presented with someone to protect her finally, does she still struggle with the idea of freeing herself from endless cycles of abuse she's found herself in for an eternity. We saw this with Toga defeating Utena as well when she betrayed her at the end of the duel of Akira and that she reverted back to her mentality of being subservient to those around her who manipulate her, as well as falling back into her own line of thinking that she doesn't know what else she could do if not for what she's enduring right now. And it also grows well with the idea that Usuna disappearing suddenly after she sacrifices herself to free Andrew from a coffin and take the swords of hate into her instead of Amphi. It wasn't literally Usuna sacrificing herself, but rather Amphi realizing she didn't have to suffer like this anymore fully and actualizing her escape from Atori and Akira once and for all. But the joy of fan theories when it comes to Usuna is that none of these have to be the one meaning behind it all, as Ikuhara has gone on record to state that every theory and explanation for what people think Usuna means is actually canon. But I think that's the best thing, because that goes alongside the idea of Usuna being so timeless that people are still theorizing over it to this day. Which is a bit unfortunate, when one of the creators decides to come back 20 years later and try to write an addendum epilogue piece that potentially annulled some of said theories. <sighs> I 
All right, so, After the Revolution, written and released by Chiho Saito in 2018 to coincide with the year following Ushina's 20th anniversary. This was made as an epilogue of sorts to the anime's ending as it explores the after effects of what happened to everyone else in the series following Ushina's sacrifice and Amphi's leaving of Atori Academy. However, it's considered the most controversial piece of the Ushina canon by many people, with some doubting its canonicity because of the fact it's a manga-only epilogue to the anime, and the fact that Saito was the only returning member of B-Papas to write for this, with no input from any other members of the collective. So, al so already we have some red flags going on here when Saito, who only exclusively made the manga versions of Ushina, is tasked herself to Doing an epilogue to the anime without any direction from the person who made the story of the anime of their work? That's a bad sign right here. But we haven't even properly delved into this. It'll make more sense as to probably why people have some issues of this when we get to talking about it properly. The first story focuses on Togo and Sayoji, with it starting off with them working at a job in New York City and buying an expensive piece of art at an auction house, and one day they both receive a letter with a familiar rose seal on it. They return to the Academy, attempting to find a painting of Akios who had since committed suicide after the ending of the series according to this, dubbed The Revolution. You get it? Them coming across a ghost of Akio as Dios who wants to, them to keep the painting safe. It then goes to, into a whole bit between Togo and Sayoji where they knocked unconscious and have a recollection of finding Uta in the coffin that fateful day, except this time around, the younger Uta is steadfast and declares she'll be a prince. And after that, it then goes into a fight between the two over someone who Togo is biting paintings of being an implied pedophile, who's operating under a new pseudonym, and Togo brushing it off as being in the past. Sayoji then duels Togo over their clashing of ideals before Ushina comes before them and grants them their own power of revolution. The two of them then awakening again to open up the door and reveal a secret bedchamber from the chairman's room. And the reveal of the revolution painting, Akio's ghost appears once more to keep the picture of the painting of Amphi for himself. Not until Toga, channeling Uta's power, ends up slaying Akio's ghost, and then the painting of the revolution changes to that of Uta and Amphi together instead, implying the true revolution wasn't just Amphi, but Uta as well. The two walk off, declaring that what the two of them had is what it truly means to revolutionize the world. The second part, Beautiful Fords, focuses on Juri and Shiori's continued lives after Atori, with Juri being a global fencing champion and Mickey being her manager as a result. But after several different small events that make her waver her confidence, including seeing her opponent as Ruka when it's not really him, she considers retirement from fencing to focus on her... modeling gig. Anyway, Shiori reveals that she has taken the person who looks like Ruka as the person she's managing. Despite their relationship having gotten better since the main series, it's clear that Juri is still far and away not over her feelings for Shiori as she splits from Juri after her reaction to seeing him takes place. What happens next is a rematch of the fencing files between the two, turning into a duel at the arena at a Tori, with Shiori as the Rose Rider in Amphi's place, Ruka declaring this to be the final duel between them. And just as Juri is about to lose to Ruka, Utena comes down from the Castle of Eternity and grants Juri the power of revolution to defeat Ruka. Whatever this manifestation is meant to be once and for all, instead, it's revealed to be a woman, not Ruka. Shiori then reconciles with Juri, having had a similar moment herself when she dreamt of Ruka, with the pendant that Juri has now having a new engraving put in, saying, Fight, Juri. And the final part of it, Eve of the Revolution, focuses squarely on Mickey and Kozaway, with Mickey having to be believed to play a piece of music at the Atori alumni party. However, Mickey hasn't played that piece of music yet as it hasn't been completed. The only other culprit would have been Kozaway. However, she's currently in a coma because of domestic violence, and but it's revealed she is actually sleepwalking in her coma to play a piece of music on the piano in question. Odd choice, but okay. But it's also revealed during this that Kozaway's feelings for Mickey never left, and once she was rejected by Mickey when she came running to him after a night of assault, she fell into a coma. Kozaway, well, Kozaway's spirit then decided to duel Mickey for believing that he abandoned her. It's then when Utena comes in and, and the reveal of them having met when they were children, having lost their parents themselves, takes place. And Utena's speech about someone having not given up on this world resonating with them, and allowing them to keep playing together. 
This caps off the part with this entire manga by having Kurzweil awaken from her coma. The two find enclosure with each other committing to play piano once more. As the younger Utena finds Anthea and declares, no matter where they may end up, they'll always find each other. Now, as much as these stories are very much just fine by themselves, when you try and have them be the epilogues for the stories of the student council members from the anime, you begin to see the big problem with this. As mentioned before, this is purely Saito's interpretation of how the 20 years later journey for each member of the council should be, and while it's very close to them, this really just feels like glorified fan fiction, if I'm being honest. And the stuff that happens in these, well, I understand that it was trying to evoke the same fee kind of feeling the series did during its run. It's missing Ikuhara's direct influence, which makes itself very, feel very empty compared to what we've looked so far. To that end, I personally wouldn't recommend this unless you're an absolute diehard who's looking to indulge in everything Utena related. So, me, essentially. But next to everything else, like the OG manga and both anime versions, I'd say this should be optional at best, and the last thing you indulge in at worst. However, it does beg an important question that we've yet to look into. What exactly did the members of B-Papas do following along from the ending of the anime's run, and the movie that followed on from it? Well... I think it's about time we delve into that last chapter, shall we? But before we delve into what the creators themselves did, there are a few Utena related things that I haven't spoken about, are there? Well, let's say we do a quick rapid fire round of that to clear out the board, huh? <gasps> Alongside the comedy musical, there were four additional musicals made after Utena finished airing. The first one, Hell Rebirth Apocalypse Out of Angel of the Nirvanic Beauty, was, made, was performed in 1999, and the second, Chorus Imaginary Living Body, performed in 2000. With information being very bare on what happened in both, aside from one image dug up by Empty Movement, and a description that implies them to be wildly different from any version of Utena prior. Ironic given I, that Ikuhara had a direct hand in the creation of both. The next two musicals that were very straightforward adaptations of the first two arcs of Utena in a traditional theater musical style, which were released to commemorate its 20th anniversary. But of the White Rose covering the Stream Council Saga in 2017, and Blooming Rose of Deepest Black covering the Black Rose Saga in 2019. To this day, it's unsure if a third one made to cover the Apocalypse Saga will ever be made, or if its plans were done pre-COVID and that ended up ruining said plans. But if it does end up coming out to complete the trilogy, I may very well have to buy my tickets to go see it, I think. The last pieces of official media to discuss are a pair of light novels released in 97 and 98, loosely adapting the first five episodes of the Student Council Saga in one, and later adapting the Siren G and Wakava Black Rose storyline into the second. These light novels, Twin Saplings and Verdant Hopes, are considered another continuity altogether from the already existing anime, manga, and adolescence continuities. So I guess that makes five different multiverses in the original multiverse theory now. Anyway, they're more shoujo-inspired versions of the stories involved, and if you want to read them, you can find them translated very well on Empty Movement's website, alongside a host of various other Utena media I've sourced or mentioned in this video from their website. They very much deserve it. Only other thing to note of these is that they were written by Ichiro Okaruchi, who would later work on the screenplays for both seasons of Code Geass, Devilman Crybaby, The Golden Age Berserk movies, Princess Principal, and Gundam the Witch from Mercury. Make of that what you will. So I guess the question remains of what B. Papas did post Utena, isn't it? Well, to start things off, you know that World of s &M series I mentioned at the top of this retrospective? Well, that was meant to be the intended follow-up for B. Papas following along from Utena, with Ikuhara and Saito working together on the manga from 2001 to 2003. And to be honest, having read the manga itself... It's fine. Like, it got negative reception when it first came out, and arguably was the direct reason why Ikuhara went on such a massive hiatus from creating anything following along from this, and Chiho Saito has barely done anything in the years after, either. It's not to say it's not worth your time, you could arguably read this whole thing in the time it takes for you to get your mouth cleaned out at the dentist. But would I recommend you read it if you liked Utena? Not really. It tries really hard to recapture that same level of meaning and overall flair that Utena had in both mediums. 
The only problem with that, however, it's basically a one-shot split into two tiny short stories, so there's really not a lot of space to really do it. Not only that, but the plot is kind of all over the place, and the way that it was released meant they weren't able to keep an audience long enough to try and be consistent. But to say that this was the thing that ended Be Papas as a collective is kind of incorrect, because in reality, the collective had basically just been Saito and Ikuhara throughout this run as Be Papas in name only, and had officially disbanded by the end of adolescence run in 1999. Ikuhara, however, did take a 12-year hiatus from directing anime during this time as well. However, he did one more thing during this hiatus from directing anime following along from the end of Utena, as prior to working on World of S&M with Saito, he wrote the two-volume novel series Shell Bullet alongside Mamoru Nagano. With an accompanying concept album composed by Tempe Sato of Disgaea fame, and was vocalized by Ikuhara himself alongside the wife of Nagano and known seiyu Maria Kawa. Kawa Mura, who funnily enough also voiced Mamiya in the original version of Utena. You know, the more I think about it, the more the entirety of Bee Papas could be a connecting point of six degrees of Kunihiguri Guhara for people in the anime and manga industry. Anyway, if you want to listen to the full album of that, you can find it very easily on YouTube. As for the novel itself, it may be a bit harder to find yourself, but if anybody finds a translated copy of it, please let me know. I'm interested in when Ikuhara's sci-fi would look given his later works. Speaking of his later works, however, he went on a 12-year hiatus from directing anime as much as previously after adolescence, having directed two of the most influential animes of the 90s. I can see why he need or want a break. So what did he come back with following along from this hiatus? In July 2011, Ikuhara returned to the anime world with Mawaru Penguin Drum, created by studio Brainspace, known for Bakano, Spice and Wolf, and Jirara's anime adaptations, and it felt from the word go that he did not miss a beat from when he left us back in 1999, as Penguin Drum is considered by many to be on par, if not THE successor to Usa in terms of themes, characters, and the unbridled trauma that this series exhibits throughout. I'm not going to go over it in detail, as I feel like the series itself like Utena, needs to be seen for itself to fully be understood and enjoyed. Plus, it has a twist in its plot that I absolutely refuse to ruin because it's arguably one of the best twists I've ever seen in modern anime, period. However, I will say this, Penguin Drum was my introduction to Ikuhara as an anime director, and arguably this series was the reason why I drew myself to Revolutionary Girl Utena to begin with. Make of that what you will, fans of Usada or Pegwa Jump, respectively. His next works, however, are ones I have no issue going into details on. Yuri Kuma Arashi, literally translated to Lesbian Bear Storm, is arguably his easiest series to watch in terms of understanding and accessibility, being released in 2015 and being viewable on Crunchyroll. You ever wonder what would happen if Ikuhara just gave up on the subtext he was trying to present to his own works and straight up made a Yuri anime with furries in it? Well, that's basically what Yuri Kurarashi is, and I love every single moment of it. If you liked Usada and Penguin Drum, this may not be your cup of tea, but if you love that gay shit, this is for you! And finally, his latest work to date, Sara's On Mai. Also available on Crunchyroll, is basically Ikuhara's take on coming of age anime, and while you could still tell it has that same sense of surrealism that every single one of his works has, you could definitely tell he's turned down on, on the more wackier aspects that the years have gone on. For the record, that's not a bad thing, mind you. A man can't exactly keep creating such intricately woven pieces of art like Utena was. Trust me, if Penguin Drum were as dense as that, I feel like it wouldn't be fondly remembered as it is now. But the fact Ikuhara is still working on stuff to this day is amazing, especially given it he's entering into what some may consider his twilight years currently. And while he hasn't directed anything since Sarazagmai, even if this is what his legacy is left on, it's a masterclass of anime directing at its finest. With that being said though, what did the other members of B-Papas end up doing post Utena? Well, information on Ogura and Hasegawa is slim to none, unfortunately, but the ones who were most active in the years following along from the end of Utena were actually Yoji Inakito and Shikichi Mitsumune. Inakito's first works post Utena actually ended up being involved for writing the anime sets such as Fully Coolie, Razafon, Nonomekan Debil, Redline, Stardriver, 
And one of the anime, not sure if you've heard of it, or at High School Fucking Horse Club! Hell, you wanna talk about series that took inspiration from Usa and its design choices? Look no further than Oron. Because if there was anything that said that Inokido was the head writer of the series, that the design flair and overall shoujo aspect being somewhat lifted from his time working for B-Poppers would be a dead giveaway. Not only that, but you know Takia Igarashi, the person I named as Iguhara's successor in Sailor Moon when discussing the directors of Sailor Moon somewhere earlier in this video? Well, he did actually work with Inokido on both Oron and Star Driver as an episode director and storyboarder on both, proving that the B-Papa's connection does not ever fail. Consider this my apology as well for not talking about Oron when discussing who took inspiration from Usna beforehand, because I feel like if I rattled off everything and every form of media that had some lingering reference or inspiration be from Usna, we'd be here until the end of time. And with Shikichi Mitsumune, he would later soundtrack such animes as the original Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. Listen to the Japanese version sometime, you're missing out some killer soundtracks from Mitsumune. Not only that, but he worked on the soundtracks for all three seasons of Rosa Maiden, all four seasons of The Familiar of Zero, and, in a very fitting collaboration, worked on the OST for Fully Clear alongside the Pillars and Ida Kido, making this the first time post that any member of, this, of that series worked together in any capacity in anime. Unfortunately, it wasn't all good news falling along from the end of Utena, as while everyone involved gained a long-lasting career as a result of this, the seiyu for Utena Tenjo, Tomoku Kawakami, wouldn't have such luck. As while she would go on to voice in such amazing anime post Utena such as Elfin Lead, Noname Cantabile, Sergeant Frog, Bleach, Dark and the Black, and would play at least one role in every key adaptation done by Kyoto Animation, and even voiced in the Klonoa series as Lolo, in 2008, it was confirmed that she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer and would battle it for three years before succumbing to it in June of 2011, ironically only a month before Ikuhara's return to anime. Members of the anime community, Ikuhara included, were in grief and rightly so over it, to the point where Nozomi Entertainment put a dedication to her in the first page of the Apocalypse Saga booklet for their release of it in 2012 marking it as one of the only times as of writing this project that the members who worked on Usuna had passed away. It was more hurtful in Tomoko's case because she never got to see the heights of which her series would see popularity not just within anime, but globally as well. As Usuna's impact globally arguably wasn't felt until it gained a much wider appraisal in the 2010s to now. And all I personally hope is that, assuming there to be an afterlife, Tomoko is seeing how much Utena has grown, and her part in it is appreciated, even now. So, that's it. That's basically all of what can be discussed about Utena, from its anime, manga, movie, video game, light novels, stage shows, you name it. We've talked about it here over the course of several hours and a year of research and time dedicated to this. But after talking all about that and then some, I still have a weird sense of emptiness to talking about all of that and still having not one thing been answered amongst everything we looked for. Because when I started out this project at the beginning of the year, I did start to do one thing. Not to show you all how much of an amazing body of work this series is, but to answer one important question. Why is Utena so important? And to be honest, while all three parts of this video could essentially be the answer for it in its own right, for how important it was to anime culture of its time, to its influence on general popular culture even of today, to even how much of an, its influence on queer culture has shaped by this series' existence, doesn't fully answer the question of why it's important. Like I said in part two about how I could easily tell you all these factors that make up why Utena as a media cornerstone is such an important deconstruction of its genres, I could easily just tell you about why Utena is so amazing and influential to the culture surrounding us. But it's a whole other thing to actually show you why the fandom it's created values a series like this so much. When I first watched this show, I was expecting some lame pretty cure shit that I was gonna have to suffer through. 
And now I've got merch, plenty of rose crests, a killer community, multiple copies of the show and movie, and more backgrounds than I know what to do with. Utena is my biggest dive into the very concept of exploration. Exploring the world, exploring what it means to be, exploring the self, exploring pain, exploring the deconstruction of black and white thinking, exploring color, exploring pacing. This show did what no honors English class could, and it continues to fluctuate with me. I used to hate Nanami. Still don't forgive what she's done. But there's part of me that grew, and in turn was able to accept more of her. Same goes for all the characters, unfortunately. And in recognizing those changes, I then find them mirrored in me. That the patience, the forgiveness, the depression showers, the want, the dysphoria, it's all there, all changing. No other piece of media affects me this strongly. Sure, there'll be whatever shows are in the present, the meta, but Utena's impact will never leave me. Even if I get dementia, I'll probably still be humming Sunlit Garden or singing Earth as a character gallery. I came across Utena in a very um, sensitive period of my life, when I was 13, 14, when I already knew that I was gay myself, I was, I was attracted to other girls, and outside of um, an online friends and outside of... Um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Sailor Moon, I didn't know um, any other queer stories, queer characters, or any queer people in real life. Um, it didn't have that comfort to me, but not only that, the queer characters were also written so well and so complicated. And, you know, the, the, they weren't just fluffy, fluffy, sweet characters. They were very complicated, morally great characters, and I loved that because it, it was written so amazingly well. And it, it then also really inspired me as an artist as well. Um, I think one of the reasons why um, I have very many morally great queer characters now is because um, of Utena. And I think, I think there's a reason why people who now, who for the first time discover Utena, um, are like uh, perplexed and taken aback with, with how dark or complex the series can be and how well written the characters and relationships are. Because it is, it, because even today it's still relevant, it's still impressive. And I think that's probably why it's not one, it's not only one of the most best shoujo anime of all time. I think it's probably one of the mo one of the best anime series of all time, in my opinion. Honestly, I think it's the fact that Utena isn't really just an anime. It's like a box of tools or like a lens with which you can view the world. When I watched Utena in 2013, uh, when I was in high school, and I was already thinking about how to explain my relationship with gender, Utena and what I think its strongly implied message of systems being shitty and you should take them down if you don't like it, it just really appealed to me. Um, but, you know, that kind of message is very general. And you can really apply it to other things. Institutional abuse. The whole metaphor in Utena is like a school. That's an institution. That's a system. And it's abusing and exploiting its students. Just like how institutions in real life do that too. But I don't think it's just that. I think it's also the community that Utena has managed to foster and kind of keep fueling even though it's a work that is like 20 plus years old. And I think that kind of a community in which not only do you make friends and you get to talk with people who are like-minded, specifically if you're a queer person and you don't really have like that kind of community or support in like your real life, you also like grow your brain. Like I can't tell you how many galaxy brain moments I've had just talking to other people who like Utena and hearing how Utena made them think about something or how something about their life related to Utena. I think works like Utena, that's why they mean so much to- it's so specific and so general at the same time. And if you happen to watch it, a lot of people when they're growing up and they're going through like, you know, 
problems of like teenagehood or, and growing up, they, they watch Neon Genesis Evangelion, right? And that isolation, they really relate to it. But then from then on, that's all that they think of when they think about these like theme. For me, I didn't watch Evangelion. I did like get into Umineko and that filled a lot of like my need to understand like abuse and generational trauma and all of that. But Utena still managed to get into my brain and fulfill that need with talking about gender and my feelings of like, you know, dissatisfaction with the system. Overall, I really can't talk about Utena in a concise manner. Utena is great. It's great in a serious way. It's great in a way that helps me not think about things so literally. And I can tell you, this isn't something that just happened overnight. It took me like, what, I watched it in 2013, now it's 2023, 10 years. But it did it. it it's helped me become more flexible. And most importantly, it I think it helps remind me to be a kind person when I can, to be sympathetic, empathetic, uh, and also to not just give in to the system or to just be a conformist. I mean, that is something we all, I think, struggle with. But I think because I watched Utena and I continue to talk about it, have brain rot about it, I... I feel like there's hope for me. I feel like one day, I'll walk out of the system just like Anthony did. I think we all can. But yeah, that's why Utena means so much to me. Revolutionary Girl Utena has been a completed series for 26 years as of this video's air date. And ever since its creation, airing, and overall lifespan, there's been no other series like it that can merge the worlds of feminist iconography, queer love, and deconstructions of anime as a whole that it's managed to do in, in its 39 episodes. It's managed to stand against time itself in nearly three whole decades, and has become not just a classic anime in its own right, but become one of the best examples of what the medium can do when you give creators the ability to do something like this with it. And it's also managed to keep a die-hard fan base behind it as well. Something of which in this era of anime, where it feels like the next big thing is coming out every single quarter or every single year, you can still find new people diving into Ushida for the very first time in their lives on websites such as Twitter, even today. Hell, while writing this script over the course of 12 months in 2023, I saw three people live tweeting their thoughts on it for the first time, and each new one I saw had differing views and opinions on each aspect of the show, it made me appreciate their viewpoints even more. Because Utena isn't just a singular experience, it's a unique and personalized to each viewer, and it's part of why I love it so much. Not only that, but the amount of people who have told me that they started watching Utena because of the videos I've made on it, it kind of gave me an ego boost, but they primarily made me feel so happy because of the fact this project was made for reasons like that. Because for every person on YouTube that makes essays dissecting Utena, there's not a lot convincingly trying to get people into Utena. So knowing that this did that job was humbling, in a way. So. For all of its amazing peaks, its crushing valleys, its confusing side turns, and its eternal impact, any way you choose to look at it, all of this is why Utena is important. <laughs> Made no sense to me. All right, my voice is shot right now a little bit, so I do apologize if it don't sound good. This mic is really good at catching everything, except for when it doesn't. Are there still fucking beads there? <laughs> <laughs>